yeah, I think so too. I'd like to call the uh, June 23rd, 2021 regular meeting of the Fens Community uh, High School District 100 regular meeting uh, to order. May I have a roll call? Yes. Figueroa? Here. Cade? Here. Galloway? Here. Radinsky? Here. Rago? Here. Ting Fo Pong? Here. Wiedemann? Here. Uh, we have a quorum. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, James, please read our Fenton Mission beliefs and Bison Way statements. Thank you. Uh, Fenton Mission and uh, Statement cultivate successful, passionate learners through rigor, relevance, and relationships. Fenton Beliefs Statement, successful, passionate learners thrive when we champion innovative teaching and engage learning, school and home collaborate effectively, we provide a safe, secure, and caring environment, we infuse social-emotional learning into academics and culture, diversity empowers our learning community, we prepare students to fulfill their civic responsibility. The Bison Way, students and adults at Fenton High School create a safe, caring, empathetic environment where we believe in each other, respect diversity, communicate openly, grow together, and hold each other to high expectation to become the leaders and innovators of the future. Thank you, James. Uh, any public comments, Mary? Yes, we do. We have one this evening. Mr. Okay. Marshall Subak. Okay, thank you. And as a reminder, public comments are limited to three minutes per speaker with a limit of 30 minutes per topic. Oh, sorry, I didn't start. Nope, I'm okay. setting it. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. President and Board. My name is Marshall Subak, S-U-B-A-C-H. I'm here for the Fenton Five and Calc Three. This is item 9F on the consent agenda. The good news is my daughter passed her junior year. So I got one year left, so you're, you're counting. It's about 11 meetings, and you probably will not see me again. I'm again asking the board to have the district pay for Calc 3 classes on behalf of the students. There's five reasons that I came up why they should pay for this. Number one, there's $18,000 left in the budget from this fiscal year for reimbursement of college classes to teachers and administration. That's $18,000 left, so it's not a new budget item, it's already been budgeted. Second reason, the district reimburses teachers and administrators for college classes. This is a policy or a compensation thing package that this board approved, and it seems illogical for the district with taxpayer money to pay for teachers' college classes and administrators' college classes, but not students' college classes. The third reason, Fenton dropped the ball. They knew about these kids for four years, and they had four years to get a teacher ready to teach Calc 3 in-house. I would much rather have Calc 3 taught by one of our fine Fenton teachers who are capable of doing this. There's a lot of them that can. They just need to be prepared and give them time. This Calc 3 program through NetMap is through the University of Illinois, a very competitive school. It sounds great until you add the $1,200 cost, you have to get a, a four or five on the Calc BC exam, not the Calc AB, Calc BC. I don't know how many kids are gonna get that. It's a remote learning class, so it's not live teaching. We know from last year, remote learning is very difficult and really doesn't work. The next fourth reason is equity. You guys are doing an equity audit. You're being trained on equity and diversity and how to look for those things. You're, being, you're going through these seminars. Ms. Papa Nicola put a, a, a photograph or a slide up where she showed through one of the presentations a fence. And it was a fence with six kids on one side and one looking over. And they're saying, that's what equity is. 
It's unfair for that child on the outside of the fence. Well, guess what? At $1,200 per student, you guys, not intentionally, you're creating a financial barrier or a fence in the future. This year, it's the Fenton 5. Next year, it's going to be the Fenton 8. And then the Fenton 10. This is going to be an ongoing issue. The last reason, it's the right thing to do. I feel like this class is going to kind of be the test bunnies or guinea pigs to try net math. Long term, it's a policy decision that this board, not the administration, makes to say, we want Calc 3 taught in-house. We want to have somebody ready so that there's no financial barriers, there's no remote learning, and it can be done by our teachers at Fenton High School. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the public comments. And uh, can we go to recognitions, please? Sure. We have one recognition. It's the INSPRA Award. Uh, Rick Kambik, our Director of Communication and PR, is not here, but he prepared the video. This is in celebration of the award for this year and as well as last year. We're celebrating last year because uh, we couldn't do it last, uh, last year because of COVID, obviously. So Jim, video, please. Good evening. INSPRA is an acronym that stands for the Illinois Chapter of the National School Public Relations Association. And every year it conducts the Distinguished Service Awards Contest. The Distinguished Service Awards recognize individuals who make a difference in their school communities by promoting public education and enhancing its programs and services. To be blunt, these individuals, by their daily nature, make my job a whole lot easier. By the, for the 2020-2021 school year, the following Fenton nominees were given awards of merit by INSPRA's committee. Good evening. INSPRA is an acronym that stands for the Illinois Chapter of the National School Public Relations Association. And every year it conducts the Distinguished Service Awards Contest. The Distinguished Service Awards recognize individuals who make a difference in their school communities by promoting public education and enhancing its programs and services. To be blunt, these individuals, by their daily nature, make my job a whole lot easier. By the, for the 2020-2021 school year, the following Fenton nominees were given awards of merit by INSPRA's committee. First, we have Mary Thomas in the support staff category. The business office at Fenton High School can be a nerve wracking place for division leaders, teachers, coaches, and club sponsors alike. You might think the anxiety is over once you're done pleading your case to the chief school business officer but there are rules for how to make purchases and how to document those purchases after the fact. Mary Thomas is Fenton's business services coordinator and she is superb at being both the good cop and the bad cop when it comes to that second half of the purchasing process. With 20 years of service to Fenton, Mary has a genuine interest in achieving the best outcomes possible. She has so much wisdom to share while guiding staff through their paperwork, and she always makes it a learning experience. Her efforts are extremely valuable to our school as a whole because she is the bridge between idea and action. Mary makes sure our students receive what is promised. With 56 athletic teams and clubs, 112 teachers across 14 academic departments, plus expenses in the cafeteria and the building and grounds department, Mary certainly has a lot to juggle. She makes it look so easy. Next, we have the Fenton vaccination team in INSPRA's team category. A small team of administrators, support staff, and maintenance staff here at Fenton worked around the clock to plan and execute 10 COVID-19 vaccination events 
that provided approximately 7,000 people with the life-saving vaccine. The first event included nearly 2,200 employees of Fenton High School, Bensonville School District 2, Wooddale School District 7, the NEDSEC Special Education Cooperative, the Village of Bensonville, the City of Wooddale, Bensonville Community Public Library, the Wooddale Public Library, and the Bensonville Park District. As you can imagine, that sort of reach touched all areas of District 100 and allowed those organizations to more safely provide their vital services to our shared stakeholders, while at the same time making our partnerships stronger than ever. Our many subsequent events served senior citizens, students, and our students' families. We partnered with local community groups and faith leaders to make sure residents of all backgrounds were aware of these opportunities and could sign up regardless of their circumstances. There are many, many people to thank and to praise for these selfless acts of compassion and bravery. But to highlight just a few, I turn back to that very first event in January. James Ontenko and Mary Timmons made dozens of cold calls trying to confirm a rumor, and they eventually struck gold and formed a relationship with Jewel Osco. Then Sam Benson, Tom Kobol, and Jovan Lazarevic created the master plan for safely signing people in and moving them throughout the building to each stage of the process. Jim Batson was our ever valuable number cruncher who scheduled appointments at safe intervals approved by Jewel Osco. He monitored our progress throughout each event and he assisted me in managing the lines of communication. That first masterful event proved ourselves trustworthy and led to Jewel Osco feeling confident in partnering with us many, many more times. These last six months of hosting vaccinations made Fenton High School a shining beacon in the community amidst a global pandemic that has affected every walk of life. And next we have James Ontenko in the administrator category. Life is already challenging and often lonely in the top leadership positions. Schools are no different, but this past year was obviously unique. The weight of the world was on James's shoulders and he had a lot of challenging decisions to make. First on the list was figuring out how to invent a virtual school. At Fenton, 70% of the students are students of color and 55% are low income. James advocated tirelessly to make sure everything was reasonable and equitable. As we faced a problem that no one had ever needed to solve, he was a steadfast leader who kept many of the conversations going so that we'd always improve what we were doing. He trusted his staff to make important decisions. And he regularly communicated to our students, families, and staff. As I previously mentioned, James was the whole reason Fenton was able to secure COVID-19 vaccines. He was also a community builder, serving as our ambassador to the other taxing bodies, to the community groups, to the faith leaders. In a profound crisis, James Ontenko provided our students and our community with stability, security, and solutions. Because of him, our school is held in such high regard. Finally, we have Eric Moreno in the student category. Eric Moreno pioneered a new program for the Chicago Bears. He didn't even know it. The newly created Chicago Bears Community High School All-Stars program selected nine students from throughout Illinois who are making a positive impact in their community and school, typically through community service or mentorship. Eric Moreno, a recent graduate here at Fenton, a senior at the time, was ranked number one among the first ever pool of applicants from all over Illinois. His choices to go above and beyond earned him the award and simultaneously highlighted what we strive to develop at our school. Throughout all the publicity, Eric was superb at continuing to advocate for those causes instead of himself. Because it was a new awards program this year, Eric was the inaugural winner. 
there wasn't a precedent to follow. Eric set the stage for all the other recipients, and boy, was he a shining star. Eric was available and prepared for every event and every interview that was scheduled. He took his cues from myself and from Coach Matthew Lynch, and he represented Fenton High School with extreme professionalism. The Bears were especially impressed with Eric's work at Goldfish Swim School, where he taught swim lessons to underprivileged Latino youth to help them learn and enjoy a safe hobby with positive role models. Another accolade the Bears took interest in was Eric's many volunteer hours at the Bensonville Wooddale Food Pantry. Eric was featured in the Bensonville Independent newspaper, the Daily Herald newspaper, WGN Radio, on the Chicago Bears website, and on the IHSA website. Also, I would like to quickly recognize last year's recipients. The ceremony last year was canceled due to COVID, and the winners were announced a bit later. Steviana Pace one of our, was one of our founding members of the Black Student Union. She participated in the Bensonville Youth Coalition with myself, and she was a key contributor to our Portrait of a Graduate Initiative. Jeff Least was our uh, transportation coordinator. We all considered him a miracle worker for keeping our buses operational and flowing on time. In one instance, he rescued a broken down bus. He delivered the students to school on time for their first class. And then he avoided a towing expense by laying under the bus on a busy highway and getting the engine operational to drive it back to Fenton. Maria Millard is an extremely dedicated mother to a graduate as well as a current student. She's often at Fenton High School volunteering in uh, concession stands, assisting our teachers, and being a second mom to many kids. Finally, our portrait of a graduate team, the superintendents of Fenton 100, District 2, and District 7 came together in unity to host many public forums on what a graduate should look like after 13 years in our combined schools. Congratulations to everyone, and thank you for your incredible contributions. Have a great night. So we have five, six items here. Uh, we're going to talk about the equity report. We will uh, discuss the DELT uh, equity action plan. Then it will be followed up with a summer school update and summer programming. Afterwards, strategic plan 1.0. We want to close that out this evening. ESSER grant update. Then we'll follow that up with COVID-19 met metrics and vaccination update. Then we have two foyers to discuss here uh, briefly. Next slide. Uh, there we go. So. <laughs> Our equity report this month is a presentation of the Fenton Equity Action Plan, or the EAP. The presentation will be given by Dr. Uh, Yvette Dubiel, Michelle Papanicolau, myself, our strand leaders, which include Ranjana Ranjdaran, Melissa Rausch, Michelle Rodriguez, Jason Madel, Jim Batson, Josh Payton, Matt Lynch, and Nancy Coleman. The action plans that will be presented this evening derive from the five equity strands in the equity audit. They are number one, systems, number two, teaching and learning, number three, student voice, climate and culture, four, professional development, and five, family and community as agency. The, the presenters are members of the Fenton District Equity Leadership Team, or DELT, and the action plan that will be presented derives from the equity audit which was completed in school year 2019-2020, approximately two years ago. The audit documented and heard the voices of students, parents, community, and administration. The district equity leadership team is constructed and will implement, constructed and will implement the equity action plan this fall. At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Yvette Dubiel, who will dive deeper into the equity plan development process and present the equity strand. Without further ado, Dr. Dubiel. Hi, good evening. Thank you for having me. Um, it is an opportunity, a grand opportunity on my behalf to be in front of the Fenton 
Board of Education. I believe this is my third opportunity to service you, so thank you again. I also want to thank the board for volunteering several Saturdays to participate in an equity professional learning and training so we can have some common understanding and language. Your participation and engagement is highly valued and uh, 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 with tons of gratitude, so thank you. Um, as uh, James stated, during the 2019-20 school year, your district conducted an equity audit. One of the things that's really important to capture in the process of the audit is that your district was not new in their action towards equity. So I applaud the district in that work. You may recall in the equity action report, there was an opportunity for the district to document their historical efforts. And it was quite impressive in the work that was, has been accomplished and continues to be accomplished. When it comes to equity, there is no final destination. Most folks have heard of the term equity is a journey, and there is a lot of truth to that. There is no final point to this. It is complex, as we are expected to consistently be critical in the process of our socialization, as well as how we can be better humans. And with that comes the anticipation of equity and the identities that we all hold and the intersectionality of those identities and our positionality in the world. As such, the institution of education requires us to be critical, highlight those areas of strength, as well as be vulnerable in areas of needed improvement. So the equity audit was an opportunity to do just that, highlight those strengths and find ways that we can do better. As a result, following the equity audit in 2019-2020, the district was ready for some action planning that allowed for accountable, measurable ways to improve its system. So with the collaboration of the district equity leadership team, your stakeholders here to service all students, they design a comprehensive robust plan. Please be aware in this comprehensive robust plan, we're constantly being very vulnerable in our process to identify those areas of strength, but know that it will not end. Know that the anticipation, the expectation is for the team to be very critical and think about what's next. How can we continuously improve? So I'm very excited and very grateful for the team, the amount of hours uh, that we came together as well as behind the scenes in developing their capacity and engaging their dialogues and really centering their work on students. And with that, I introduction of the district equity leadership team. Let's do this. Board, just real quickly, a lot of the individuals, part of the DELT, gave up their evening to be here with you. We're going to make a presentation. I'm asking all the people that's involved with DELT to stand behind Michelle yes. so we can have the presence here. That includes myself, Bruce, and Sam. Yep. Matt Lynch. Yep. And this is really only a very small portion of the team. Um, if Jim t takes us to the next slide, you will see the amount of membership on our DELT equity leadership team. We have about 38 members of our staff that have been involved in some form or fashion between the audit and the, the equity uh, action planning. They're highly dedicated and a highly enthusiastic team. They care about kids and our students here at Fenton. Um, it, this list shows a strong cross-section of our staff um, at all corners of our organization. Um, some of these members of our staff serve as parents and community members as well. I think it's important to note this is a living membership. We've had members come on. We've had members come off and we'll encourage members to continue joining the equity leadership team if they so wish. We'll also have family and community and student uh, voice as part of this plan. As you'll see us talk about the objectives today, you'll notice there's strong uh, opportunities for our other stakeholders to be involved. So it doesn't just stop at staff. We just needed to create the appropriate opportunities for our community members, family, and students to be part of this planning. So we are going to take you through all of the, the 
five strands tonight, give you a nice overview of the objectives we've created, how we'll measure those, and how they align to our various district goals across different plans like our strategic plan, or our mission statements, or our belief statements, some of our policies, and you'll hear from each of our strand members today, or our strand leaders, and some of the actual strand members. So we're gonna start with systems, and we're gonna ask that Jim Batson come up to the podium and tell us about our systems objectives. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Jim Batson, um, happy to be uh, presenting on behalf of the systems strand. Uh, members of this strand include Bruce Martin, our CSBO, uh, myself, uh, Matt Lynch, uh, Rachel George Cake, I, I always mess this one up, George Cake, yes. Sorry, Mick, Rachel, uh, get tongue twisted. Uh, James Antanko, uh, and we worked with institutional systems. So, as you can see here, it's to ensure an anti bias, anti racist system, systemic and continuous development towards advancing equity through policies processes, procedures, initiatives, decision-making, and fiscal responsibilities. Um, what are systems? Systems are, are, are the things that, the, the processes and the, 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 the way in which we do our work. Uh, not what we do or how we do it, but the, the way in which that work progresses. Um, I have the clicker. Um, a couple of the objectives, research and seek out feedback from our community in order to widely communicate a de de definition of equity, diversity, inclusion to all stakeholders with specific focus on anti-bias and anti-racist uh, language. And this is, I think, very important because it sets the tone for what all the other work, uh, how all the other work happens. It, it creates a, a terminology and, and and uh, a language that we can all share and we can all recognize and uh, really understand. Um, it also helps us uh, work with the community, both inside the, uh, the building and throughout the district to really define this definition of what equity means to Fenton. Uh, <laughs> yes, we can. I, uh, Yeah, I, th that's not part of my presentation right now. I don't know if somebody else wants to take that on when we're finished um, with our presentation. I, yeah, I, we, we appreciate the question. Yeah. Uh, can, when we get to the presentation, we can definitely talk in, on break yeah. or something about that. Would that be okay? We, so, so how we're going to measure this is we have a, a, a new tool called uh, a Kelvin uh, survey that we're going, going to be using to measure some of this. And really, it aligns and will impact uh, all of these things on the, on the right column, the mission and vision, portrait of a graduate work, uh, our Bison Way, our strategic plan, and our future strategic plan, staff handbook, student handbook, board policies, uh, which we uh, reviewed some earlier this evening, uh, program of studies. Uh, uh, it, it's really, it will impact a lot of the documentation and a lot of the processes and procedures that, that we use here at, at the district. At the district. Um, the next objective is uh, from a hiring perspective and determine hiring and recruitment policies and procedures with an anti-biased, anti-racist lens. And it's really a, a, a way to ensure that through our recruiting policies, uh, we, we do uh, a good job of, of recruiting so that our, com our school district, the people that work here, actually reflect what our community looks like and really uh, brings people in with um, you know, anti-racist, anti-biased um, um, beliefs and really understands how, um, how this work uh, impacts what we do on a day-to-day -day measure. And how we'll measure this is the adoption of revised policies that better reflect Fenton's definition of equity, and that gets back to the first objective, and we're gonna define what that means, uh, what equity means to us collectively uh, and it, that will be reflected in this process, and then it will align that by board policies, staff handbook, uh, and our frontline system, which is really the system that uh, uh, navigates our hiring processes. Next up, uh, teaching and learning. Uh, oh, yes, the clicker. 
Uh, my name is Josh Payton. I'm the strand leader for the teach, uh, teaching and learning strand. Um, I have had the privilege during those countless hours that we've spent uh, working together to be part of a team that included Michelle Papa Nicolau, uh, Melissa Rausch to my right here, uh, Mark Grelichars, Linda Santanello, and Kate Ward. Um, Mark is a member of our technology department. Um, Ms. Rausch works in our English department. Uh, I'm lucky enough to work with her this summer, uh, getting some kids through our, in our English extension. Uh, Ms. Ward is an administrator, and Linda Santanello is part of our uh, math department. So during our time together, we have focused on our programming with the purpose of advancing equity among all students. Some of the things that we specifically focused on is how we can intentionally embed more equity driven practices and pedagogy in our curriculum, um, in our resources, in our instructional approaches, and the use and consideration of assessment um, in, in what we're doing. And we are really proud of our work so far, and we feel like it's not any more important than the other strands, but specifically this strand is important because it is like the first line with our students. We're in direct contact with them every day. We've had a really nice opportunity through some of the data to get their feedback, which we'll go over in some of our further slides, but it's been a really awesome experience to this point. Ms. Roush. All right. Um, as Josh said, we really focused on taking a look at the feedback from the equity audit. When we began this work, we knew we had to lean into what was provided in terms of data there. And we began taking a look also at the policies and the mission statement that already exist um, here within the district to help guide us as we developed these four objectives. Um, our first objective, uh, came to us as we began looking at one of the noted areas of improvement in the equity audit. And that noted area of improvement uh, was inequitable instruction of historical contributions, incorporating culture into the learning, and not enough hands-on learning. One of the direct pieces of feedback from a student uh, that was gathered during the equity audit um, was, and I quote, the school does nothing in the curriculum to value and celebrate unique cultures. It's just the clubs. But inside the classroom, it's never discussed, and it's an isolating experience for people, and it should be part of the curriculum. So as we considered you know, that and other comments that students and faculty and uh, family members had said, we thought about that area of improvement. We looked to board policy 6.4, which states to assist the student in developing sensitivity to the needs and values of others and respect for individual and group differences, as well as policy 6.1, which states to encourage self-discovery, self-awareness, self-discipline, and self-worth. As we considered all of those, we came to the understanding that we needed to formalize our approach to culturally responsive education. And in so doing that, we came up with the objective that we would adopt the Illinois State Board of Education culturally responsive teaching and leading standards for all. Um, this is an extensive document that has been proposed to the Illinois State Board of Education as an amendment um, and lists a variety of different standards focusing on asset-based uh, pedagogy, looking at student advocacy, um, and looking at individual backgrounds to focus our um, curriculum. So we thought this is an important piece to what we do in the classroom. Um, in taking a look, we are going to measure this by having our departments um, create an evaluation of, cult they're going to evaluate the culturally responsive teaching standards in our current curriculum framework. And also we're going to gather student feedback on classroom conditions for learning and use some Kelvin sur surveys. Our next Strand, Josh will take, or objective. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, again, looking at the data that was collected, um, we came to the idea of the objective implementing grading systems and policies that are equitable and based on research strategies. Um, some feedback that we did receive in the report indicated that uh, 
we, we needed to support systemic proof of culturally responsive instruction. Um, so in order to do that, we, we want to look at our grading systems. Um, the measure of that will be an analysis of success rates across the school. Um, we want to develop school-wide values for grading. So, I mean, we've, we've been doing a great deal of work already to look at our grading practices and policies, our curriculum. So this will just build upon that. Um, and this is all in alignment with our strategic plan and a book titled Grading for Equity by Joe Feldman. Our third objective, um, again, we leaned into that data, uh, specifically um, it, the data and the board policy. And we're looking at board policy 6.6, .6, which said to develop the fundamental skills which will provide a basis for lifelong learning in order to function effectively in a changing world. And when we took a look at that student benton equity report, um, one piece of feedback among many stood out to us uh, and a student had said they don't push the students to take electives like applied tech where students learn meaningful skills they will utilize in life and better prepare them for the future. This is just one comment of many um, with the same, a similar sentiment that it's important for us to be really taking a closer look at those life skills, um, alternate skills that many of our students are looking to expand beyond and after they leave us. So in considering that, our objective is to provide students access to programs of study that include industry-aligned coursework, authentic work-based learning experiences, college credit courses, and industry certifications and credentials. Um, again, uh, the measure of this is a review of the ESSA and college career indicator, dat indicator data, and this is something that we have already begun. We have one more objective in this strand. Our final objective in this um, strand really has to do with the alignment to those Illinois State Board of Education culturally relevant teaching and learning standards. Those standards, to me, talk about personalizing learning for students, making the experience um, of their learning more closely aligned to who they are, what they believe, what their interests are, and what their passions are. And we need to do a better job of that. Um, we want to, as an objective, implement personalized and blended learning for students across all academic settings. The blended learning uh, also addresses the opportunity to intervene more deliberately with students who need the help. In a blended learning format, students who are succeeding can sometimes learn more independently, and those students who are, need more assistance can remain in a classroom and get the kinds of supports they want. There's not always 25 to 30 students in a classroom at one time, allowing teachers to more explicitly and deliberately support students with enrichment or those who need help. So we're starting a pilot group of teachers who will start implemented blending learning strategies, uh, and they will be trained this summer, and we will assess the students' feedback that are involved in those blended learning settings um, as a measurement of this objective, and we will also develop personalized learning look-fors. So there's a clear understanding of what that actually means. What does it mean to personalize learning for our students? And we will have look fors for teachers and for administrators and other staff to understand what that looks like in a classroom. So those are our teaching and learning objectives. We will move on to student voice and climate. Thank you for your time tonight and uh, allowing me to speak to you about student voice and the importance of it. Um, before I get started, I want to make sure I mention everybody who worked with me on this strand. Uh, Pedro Castro, Julia Bray, Todd Becker, Dio Velez, Sarity Williams, Garrett Jerger, Rick Cambick, Kelly Mullins, Lauren Lem, and myself, Jason Mays. So in that group, we have deans, an athletic director, the director of social-emotional learning, 
um, Mr. Kambik, who you saw speak earlier, and several teachers from different departments. So we were very well represented. And I'm not surprised because, in my opinion, we looked out and got the fun one. So we got to talk about student voice and climate. And no doubt everybody in this room is here because we care about the students. We know they're the lifeblood of our school. So that is what our strand was based on. As you read up here, it says that we are looking to cons consistently seek students' feedback and experiences on organizational culture and climate. So how are we going to do that? Well, we had three objectives. The first objective, um, the, the wordy version of it is to create and sustain a diverse student-led equity leadership team that advises the district in developing long-term proactive solutions to improve student behaviors and adult mindsets surrounding school expectations. Uh, the shortened version, and the way I would explain it to someone who asked me what this is supposed to be, is it is a way for us to encourage student voice, value student voice, and amplify student voice. So we have um, committees where students are a part of it, alongside uh, adults where they're working in conjunction with one another. This would be a little bit different in that it would be a student-led leadership team that develops their own specific goals for improvements they would like to see in the school with the aid of one or two adults. So the students would be driving this. The students are going to say, we don't like this. This is a problem. But the most important part of that is, okay, you don't like this. What can we do? What do you suggest? What is your idea? The idea would then be that the adult is kind of the liaison, the student is not ready to go directly to um, the higher ups, and that there would be someone kind of brokering a deal excuse me, on their behalf. So that was our first objective, and we did refer to school board policy 712. Our second objective is uh, it's an exciting and it's a fun one. Um, so this one is basically creating an opportunity for students to recognize one another. I will be the first to say that the adults in our school do a fantastic job of recognizing our students for, for great acts, for their accomplishments, for things like that. But I do think that there is something special about peer-to-peer -peer recognition. And I think, you know, for whatever reason, if my mom or dad tells me something, I say, okay, whatever. But if my friend tells me that, oh, well, then it must be true. So this second objective um, is to utilize some of the things up there, Fenton Faces, Department Awards, star student shout-outs, and state send-offs, but then also incorporate more ways for the students to recognize one another, whether that be through announcements, whether that be through some type of program where they, through the school, pass notes to one another, not on their own, um, and just recognize one another because we do think that is a powerful thing um, for students to recognize themselves along with the adults continuing to do that. And that's called Cheers for Peers, by the way, that's what we're calling it. The final one is one that is near and dear to my heart, and this is restorative practices. Um, it is interchangeable with restorative justice, but in the school systems, we like to refer to it as restorative practices. And I do want to very briefly mention what my understanding of restorative practices is. Um, I myself used to think restorative practices was a way of letting students off the hook and not holding them accountable. Studied it, studied it, got a certificate in restorative practices, and I learned that it is not letting students off the hook. In fact, it is the opposite. It is forcing students to own what they did, to take responsibility for wrongdoing. It is also then encouraging them to right that wrong. So to be more responsible for their own actions. The idea there is that we are not just ostracizing the students and saying, you're bad, you get three detentions. It's instead a chance to okay, you did something that offended your teacher. We'd like you to be a grown-up about this and talk to the teacher about this, alongside 
some type of consequence. So it's not, no one's getting off scot-free or anything like that. One of the sayings that I learned about in restorative practice that I believe in is that punishment is passive and restoration is active. And that really resonated with me. You know, if you give a kid a, a, an in-school suspension, what do they have to do? They sit in a room for eight hours and I don't know what they're doing. However, if we're, if we're doing restorative practices, we are working with them, alongside them, helping them understand how to right a wrong. And I think that's very powerful. So now, to the actual <laughs> objective, um, we want to implement this at all levels in the school. Anyone who, any adult who is employed by Fenton High School who walks around in the hallways will understand restorative practices. But in order to do this the right way, we need to start small. So we will be putting together a core restorative practices team this fall. We will have a book study that talks a little bit about the methodology of restorative practices, what really makes it tick, what makes it work. We will then use the core members to then help us branch out with the intention of training the entire staff on restorative practices. So the lunchroom, the hallways, the teachers, whomever it is, is all, are all treating our students the right way and holding them accountable the way that we see best fit. Thank you for your time. Hello. Um, so the members of the professional development strand include strand leader Mike Barago, who couldn't be with us today, um, Sam Benson, the director of human resources, and five teachers, English teachers Stephanie Jackson and Patrick Escobedo, math teachers Jabelle Cushing and Clint Porter, and myself, Ranjana Rajendran, and I teach social studies. So the professional development goal is to provide a continuum of professional learning and growth opportunities for all staff in pursuit of educational equity. So when we first started meeting, the professional learning strand wanted to develop a plan that wasn't overwhelming to staff, but would also engage them in taking part in an equity journey, starting from wherever they are. We also wanted to build in opportunities for reflection and growth to evaluate our contacts with our students and our community. We were mindful of the different types of work that each professional does in the building. The types of needs of an administrator are very different than that of a support staff member. And teachers have very different needs from each of those as well. Even though there are differences in the work that we do, we decided on three objectives because we felt that they could be applied to every adult in our building, but could be adapted to our various roles. We looked at the board policies around student social emotional development, the CASEL standards, and the Fenton framework for teaching to align objectives with tasks for each of these objectives. They also closely align with the work in SEL that we have been engaged in as a school for the past four years. I press this. Yay. Our first objective is to ensure every facilitated PD by the district acknowledges and utilizes equity as a foundational to new and enhanced learning. While we know that the systems group is preparing an equity statement for the district, the professional learning group believes that a sub-statement that orients our professional learning and equity is necessary to ground each meeting in the work um, of equity. Ideally, at every meeting, would start with this equity statement. Whether a committee meeting, a meeting of the um, instructional leadership team, or the teacher's professional learning communities. This also connects the work of the professional learning strand to the other strands in the plan. An indicator of this objective will be to do a post-training reflection that will connect to the culturally responsive teaching and learning standards. Some of the tasks that we'd like to accomplish in this next school year is to create, um, to establish a uniform professional development format that encompasses equity, which we are doing through the Highlander Institute and the DEI work that we'll be doing with Dr. Dubiel. We will develop an explicit statement on professional development's connection to equity. And then we will identify phases for equity progress. And those I'll be talking about in our next slide. Our second objective 
is to direct all staff to identify personal goals in regards to equity knowledge and or social justice advocacy throughout the school year. Based on Dr. Dubiel's audit, attendance at quarterly meetings of the um, EOS committee and informal conversations with our colleagues, we know that staff are eager to learn how to make our school more equitable, but are also wary of making mistakes. We wanted to harness the time that our school has built in for the professional development, including instructional leadership team, professional learning communities, and instructional uh, coaching cohorts. To do this work, we need to create a baseline initial survey data for individuals to use for reflection purposes and determine progress. Staff members will be able to self-identify where they are in their own equity journey. We hope that this will allow our colleagues to feel like we are meeting their needs. This initial survey for determining where people are in their equity journey will identify the three strands that our, um, each staff member will be a part of. The first strand is understanding equity. Individuals in this strand are in the initial stages of their equity journey. They're learning the language about themselves and the biases that influence their perception of the world. Navigating equity, individuals in this strand are familiar with the work in DEI, but want to start to actually apply these concepts into their classrooms and their own lives. And finally, transforming equity. Individuals in this strand are individuals who are deeply embedded in the daily work and are interested in changing policy, community impact, and activism. Our strand truly believes that most of us will probably be in the first two levels for this school year. We imagine, we realize rather, that working towards equity is a continuous process and we have a long way to go. A few more of the tasks that we have are to compile resources that match the individual journey. Our goal here is to provide professional development that matches each level of understanding, including um, training on restorative justice as well as continued work with Dr. Dubiel. And then equity cohorts, which means to leverage the existing cohorts to develop that professional development. Another task that we still need to work on is to work with administration to identify times for our support staff to engage with this objective. Our final objective is to ensure onboarding of all new staff on equity-related topics. We wanted to help our new staff members have the common vernacular that we have learned throughout this year, as well as the work that we are continuing to do. The tasks that we want to accomplish are the following. All new hires will go through DI training, similar to the work that the board is doing right now. This will hopefully establish the knowledge for all staff. Based on the current plans, all new hires will go through DEI training, which will provide them with the foundational knowledge of the work that we have done so far as a school. We are hopeful that this professional development plan will meet the unique needs of our administrators, faculty, and support staff. Thank you so much for your time. Hi, the last strand focuses on the involvement of the community and families of Fenton. The members include Nancy Coleman, the Division of Special Ed, Melissa Toe, uh, one of our counselors, former principal Jovan Lazarevich, and myself, Michelle Rodriguez, ESL coordinator and ESL teacher. So throughout the process, we took a look into the considerations and the challenges that were listed in the audit. Um, but first, I wanted to go over a little bit of the purpose, which is to partner with families and community for authentic opportunities to serve students, the school, and of course, the district. So in our audit, it included some of the challenges um, which um, mentioned low parent participation in school events, growing lower social economic demographic, language barriers in regards to communication, and then other areas that were regarded as strong but needed a structure were the following. 
we have a variety of parent programming that addresses the needs of our diverse community. The question is how we unify these various efforts for a more equitable outcome for students and parents. The audit also included some staff and family interviews that gave the following qualitative data. The theme was around partners with family and community. The stakeholder in regards to the staff noted areas of strength, Padres Unidos and the Polish parent outreach, areas of needed improvement, little to no community outreach to entice families. In regards to the stakeholder of the families, they noted the areas of strength being appreciated the support and recognition of the Guatemalan families that recently refuged. Padres Unidos is also appreciated. In the areas of needed improvement, it remarked rude encounters by some office personnel and people answering the phone, lack of cultural responsiveness by people answering the phone in regards to disrespect that was felt if English was not spoken. The equity audit has helped guide our next steps to help fully engage our schools and our community. So in our first objective, we would help bring all the resources together in one platform to help keep the community informed. So our objective includes developing and maintaining the Community Equity Advisory Committee. So what we would do is we would gather all of the different parent organizations that we currently have and also invite other members that are not represented to come together. And our areas of measure would include a purpose statement, membership roster, meeting agenda in minutes, one book initiative, an equity rubric, and our Kelvin feedback form. And we aligned this with the strategic plan of communication, collaboration, community, and also board policy 8.10. The second objective addresses feedback about the personnel to be culturally responsive to the different members in the community, which as we noted in the qualitative data was something that um, the community felt that needed to be addressed. So the objective includes maintaining a feedback form for parents and community members to support the development of appropriate culturally responsive training for support staff. We feel that all of our equity work should go from the top also down to a simple um, phone call and we are wanting to address this and uh, measure it in the following ways. The Calvin feedback form, a comment log and record of the responses, training manuals and modules, and then a certificate of completion of training. And that aligns with our strategic plan again with communication, collaboration, and community, and our board policy 8.10 based on community relations. The last objective that we have helps with communication so that various members of the community feel included and informed of the variety of events, activities, and resources that we have here available. So the direct objective is to leverage the existing technology to provide equitable access to school-based communication. And some of the ways that we would like to measure this is the community survey results, technology review. And again, it aligns with the strategic plan of communication, collaboration, community, along with the board policy 8.10 of community relations. How about this group? A remarkable, thoughtful, impressive group. <laughs> That's quite a plan. We have a lot of work ahead of us. <laughs> um, we have a lot of uh, dedicated staff members who are ready um, and eager to get this work started. So um, our next steps as a district equity leadership team are to really communicate this plan to our stakeholder groups, right? So at the beginning of our school year, we will present to the whole staff on August uh, 10th. 
and then we'll start creating um, and publishing our equity website so our, communi our community can see our plans. Um, we'll also have to calendar um, our monitoring of this plan. We'll have touch points to monitor our progress. Um, we'll have a final evaluation of this plan in spring to see did we accomplish everything we set out to? Do we have to rethink some things, um, revise, or what's the next step in certain areas? And at this time next year, probably a little earlier, we'll be presenting to you again the equity action plan for the 2022-2023 school year. So this is a one-year plan. As you can see, it's ambitious, um, but I think it's very thoughtful and deliberate, and we're hopeful that it helps create a better place for our students here at Fenton, and, and gets us, um, you know, continues us on this journey of equity that we've been on and that we want to continue to take. Um, finally, I just want to say thank you to obviously all the members of the DELT leadership team um, and everybody who came here tonight to represent that team and to speak with you. Thank you, and to Dr. Dubiel, Obviously, her, she's very, she has a very clear and efficient process, and her expertise has been invaluable to helping guide us in a, not only uh, the area of diversity, equity, inclusion, but strategic planning and leadership and, and, and change leadership. So um, we thank her, and um, finally, we want to thank you all for your support in these efforts. You know, it takes a, a supportive board to move this kind of work forward, and we really do appreciate it. And that's it. Did you want to say anything else, Dr. Dubiel? Yes, Dr. Yeah, Dubiel, okay. could, could we answer that question of the difference between Did equity you want to the equity and, versus and yeah. yes, please. Just, just get it on. They don't hear you. I, I know it isn't. No. I, th I think it'd be good just to say it, just so we know. I think it'd be good just to make sure we distinguish the two. Our board is asking um, the difference between equity and equality. Mm -hmm. So there's various interpretations, but I think it's important to provide some historical context of why it's necessary. We have, luckily, some Supreme Court hearings that have exemplified that we haven't always been equal. The Civil Rights Act, Supreme Court findings that have shown that we haven't always been equal. <laughs> Thank you. If you can't hear me, let me know. I am hard of hearing, so if you have questions, feel free to raise your voice or I'm going to get creepy close. Okay. So uh, one of the things that's really important is, uh, for example, I use the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Brown versus Board of Education. That would be a classic example to think big picture why equality and equity are in fact different. One can argue, well, everybody had equal access to education. But we know the resources and the quality of the resources were in fact not equal. We and the US Supreme Court ruled we needed equity because those resources were not in fact at the same level. And so that would be a classic example. Now when it comes to equity and what districts adopt in their definition of equity, it's really important that it is about giving students what they need to thrive, whether it's our special education students, our English language learner students, our students free and reduced lunch population, a number of different identities because they do not have equal access to thrive. And so equity allows us to ensure that we do and look at the system, look at our policies, our procedures, our practices. Um, and oftentimes there's a misnomer, popular misconceptions about DEI work doesn't mean it's true or accurate. It means that education and knowledge is needed and the understanding of the historical context of it and the twisting of the narrative doesn't make it so. And it is a hard and complex, power-based, pervasive, pervasive dynamic that facts have proven in a number of ways that equal doesn't mean that everyone is actually equal. So by emphasizing equity, we can aim for that, provide those resources, the support, and lead for and advance humanity.
Next slide, Jim. Let's keep going. So the next up is B, summer school update and summer school programming. We're having a fantastic summer school. Shout out to Jason Mado, uh, Pedro Castro is leading the charge to summer school. We have 291 enrolled students, highest that's ever been. Last year, I think we got about 150. Uh, it could be the highest ever. Thanks, folks. Uh, uh, the biggest number, again, uh, enrollment. Uh, classes, summer school classes include accelerated geometry, consumer education, credit recovery, uh, driver's ed, English one, ESL bridge, algebra, literacy and math skills, math extension, and PE recovery. Summer school programmings include AP summer boot camp, culinary, robotics, STEM, world language, and rocketry, a huge, huge uh, part of of the summer programming, it's actually fun. Athletic, uh, athletic and club summer camps are also included in this summer programming, which includes band, link crew, football, basketball, tennis, wrestling, golf, cross country, softball, cheer, track, volleyball, and soccer. And lastly, we have students worker this year, like every other year prior to um, COVID. We have six student workers this summer. They assist, assist Mr. Coble and his team, prepare the building for next fall. Tasks include, but not limited to, cleaning classrooms, lockers, buses, and moving furniture. It is truly a win-win situation for these students who will gain work experience and for the district that can use an extra pair of hands. <coughs> um, next up here is the strategic, uh, strategic Plan 1.0 summary. Um, let's see where that slide is. Next slide, Jim. Okay. This picture here, you guys remember this picture? Some of the board members were here. Uh, I think uh, Kit was here, Paul. I see Patty, Juliet, Leo, I don't see you here. Let me know. Okay, anyway, this was <laughs> taken almost approximately three years ago when we had our first strategic plan committee complete the strategic plan framework. The committee was composed of students, staff, community members, parents, administrators, and board members. Time do sure fly. Okay, this evening we will present a summary of our three-year strategic plan, which will end June 30th, and we're looking forward to start strategic plan 2.0 in the fall, which this board will lead to create. We will have, uh, we will share with you the major takeaways and major accomplishments of the strategic plan 1.0. Presenters include Jim Batson, Michelle Popper, Nicolau, Sam Benson, Bruce, Bruce Martin, and myself. Uh, to summarize. Next slide. Jim. Good evening again. Um, <laughs> this is a, a brief summary of our uh, strategic plan. As uh, Mr. Antanko said, it developed uh, three years ago during the 19, uh, during the 2017, 2018 school year. Um, and included a, a large number of people. I remember a number, a large number of very long meetings in this room with many tables and a lot of uh, activity. Uh, March of 2018, this board, uh, the board at the time, approved uh, this um, plan along with um, uh, uh, never mind. I'm <laughs> <laughs> went off in a different tangent. Uh, approve this plan for use uh, for the next three years. Uh, it contains a bunch of, um, of action items that uh, were developed both for the first year and subsequent years. Uh, and, and each year we've uh, reviewed those items both with the board and on, a, uh, on our webpage on our district uh, uh, strategic plan dashboard. So that took us from the 2018 to 2021, which is where we are now. Um, out of that, we've all seen these, the mission statement and the belief statements that we read at the beginning of every board meeting. We actually read them at the beginning of every administrator meeting and many of our other meetings that occur within the, the, the building, within the district. These are very important statements for us to keep in mind. So these, uh, that, that strategic plan has sort of uh, framed our uh, processes and our thoughts um, as we've uh, progressed through these three years. I won't read those again, we've already read them. Um, and then we came up with six themes and 
as you've seen, there's two banners up at the front of the room here. Those have been up here since that point in time, outlining these, uh, these six uh, themes, the curriculum and instruction and assessment, professional development, communication, collaboration, and community, student life, meeting the unique needs of learners, and securing the future. And all the, uh, the items in the strategic plan fell into one of those themes. And we had uh, uh, many action items. So tonight we're just gonna give a brief overview of those, uh, starting with um, curriculum and instruction and assessment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, we had a, a number of objectives in this um, plan, but I'm gonna focus our attention uh, mostly on the development and the sustainability of a professional learning community model where um, teachers learn from one another, where they use data to make informed decisions in their instructional and instructional approach and in their curriculum. And they really um, are embrace a culture of risk taking where they can feel comfortable learning from their peers and maybe even from their failures at times. So we've spent a lot of time developing a culture over the last three years where pe people feel safe to really dive into some innovative practices and to learn from one another. So that, that's a big takeaway from this strand, as well as um, our curriculum redevelopment. We essentially redeveloped almost every um, course we have Mm -hmm. Our departments develop competencies and skills. So our instruction is more based on what students can do rather than what they can know or memorize, right? We wanted to ensure that our curriculum fostered higher level thinking and the application of actually being able to perform and not just sit, take in information and regurgitate it. So we redeveloped our curriculum in almost every area that will then lend itself to the redevelopment of how we give feedback, how we assess, and how we grade. Those are the big takeaways. Jim, if you could go back, I'm gonna put uh, Michelle on the spot. Michelle, can you talk about, we talked about instructions and curriculum, but how did it affect the students? Could you talk a little bit about the student achievement, AP District of the Year, equity, some of the, the big things that we have moved in graduation rates? Oh, sure. Well, I, I think we're all aware of the achievement of, um, the AP District of the Year, that's actually an equity award, right? We were able to ensure that students um, from minoritized groups had um, better, they closed the gap in terms of access to rigorous coursework. And we had more students involved in AP than ever before, more students from minoritized groups uh, involved in AP than ever before, they're scoring high, and they were finding success, and they still are. So we have been really proud of our work with Equal Opportunity Schools to that end, and helping us really dig into our data and think about what are we doing and how do we ensure all of our students have access and that our students who do take that leap and pursue credit-bearing courses or college credit-bearing course, college credit courses can find success in those. So that was part of our advanced placement programming as well. Yeah, that and I'd like to also add that a, it, it doesn't mean we focus on AP, TCD or CTE classes, uh, educational classes has also been expanded and through the curriculum changes and through the enhancement, we have increased graduation rate as, uh, as well as uh, uh, mm -hmm. freshmen on track. I think one other, and if, I, if, I, if you don't mind, the no. one that's really kind of close to, the, to my heart in the area of curriculum and instruction and assessment um, is that development of programming for career pathways, yes. yeah. right? I mean, we have to ensure that our students have opportunities to find pathways into high wage careers, right? And um, by creating programs of study where they have workplace experiences they develop those leadership skills and we give them a leg up against their peers and we give them the opportunity to have those skills to be successful in college and any other post-secondary track they might take, right? Whether they're going into the military or directly into work or an apprenticeship, whatever it is, we want our students to leave with, with employability, mm -hmm. professional skills. 
Next slide. Okay, meeting the needs of uh, unique needs of students. Michelle and Sam. Please, do you want me to start? Yeah, go ahead. So this is our SEL programming. Or I think that was probably one of our <coughs> greatest strengths over the last three years. Um, we saw our SEL committee um, really thrive, and we implemented a school-wide program called Ruler um, that is that helps students with self-awareness, the social. Uh, social regulation and just social awareness and w you can see posters throughout the building there was lots of passive program active programming and um, we, we saw some great success in that area we continued with a lot of great ELL programming under the direction of Kate Ward um, so we could uh, foster not only um, the important resources for our students but for our families as well um, we started some work on MTSS, which is the multi-tiered systems of support. Really where we had to start there was with our data. So we had to create a really good sound data dashboard. And Eileen Roberts and Yovan Lozadovich really worked through that. And um, we continue to work on our co-teaching program and our programming for students with um, IEPs. For the new people, SEL? Social emotional learning. And E-E-L-L? -L? Sorry, um, English language learners. All right, I, I, I <laughs> just I wanted to make sure I had. Thank you. I okay. <laughs> just want to make sure I'm getting this right. So, so for this uh, professional development, I think the simplest way to put it is, as Michelle articulated our curriculum initiatives, you have to have professional development along the way in order to make those a reality. Take uh, PLCs, for instance, in its infancy, uh, through professional development and collaboration, we've been able to, to grow these teams over time. Uh, part of that is also empowering our teachers to continue to lead and grow. You saw that tonight. Um, it wasn't just administrators talking about our equity plan. It's teacher leaders who are playing an active role uh, moving forward with, with how we do things. And, and then other areas, uh, Michelle talked about grading initiatives, uh, standards, personalized learning. These are all uh, points of focus through the strategic plan. And also, uh, I would say data tools. And I would thank Michelle and Dr. Batson for their work constantly seeing what kind of tools are out there that can help us analyze the data, uh, concisely bring the data together so we can make sense of it and then plan appropriately. So, and then of course, SEL, which was mentioned. So we talked about six themes those are the themes that we focused on, a nice balanced approach to uh, professional development over the past three years. And then uh, student life. I think more than anything, what I'd like to emphasize is coming out of the pandemic. We need kids to get involved again. Uh, even though we had some nice programming, even some nice remote programming, some limited activities, it, it was remote, it wasn't together. And I think we want to reemphasize that. And data has been collected over time where our, participa our participation rates have been going up in activities and athletics. And we want that to continue. So we're gonna to continue to take a look at that and what kind of programs we offer. Not to mention to our 21st century grant, we want to expose students to different opportunities. Josh Payton, who was just here, is doing a culinary experience over the summer. You've got 10, 15 kids in there all doing new types of learning as far as cooking and, and culinary. They're, they're looking to take that to the next level on how can they participate in society and donate the food that they're making. So, so anyway, this is all part of this exposure <coughs> so, we, so our kids can find their passions to, to move forward. And of course, we've mentioned SEL numerous times tonight that permeates pretty much uh, all these themes. This next one is communication and collaboration. Uh, the major trust here is very simple. It's, it's to improve our communication um, in all phases. We put a lot of effort in this, in this goal and we accomplished many topics. Some of the topics include, but not limited to our weekly newsletter, right? Our monthly newsletter as well to both villages, annual report to our community, uh, special topic emails related to COVID, 
and our Fenton articles that are being published in the Bensonville paper, the Bensonville Independence, in a weekly basis. In addition, we have held coffee with the superintendents, coffee with the principal, and town hall meetings to make sure our community uh, is aware of what's going on at, at, at Fenton. Uh, parent uh, outreach has been very, very strong this last three years. That includes our English language learners parent survey, ELL, uh, John, the creation of BPOP, okay, bilingual parent, um, uh, bilingual parent outreach program, uh, and our bilingual parent uh, uh, bilingual educational program as well. Uh, we also have our Polish outreach, our Padres Unidos, and our PTO. School district outreach all includes stronger collaboration and ties with District 2 and <coughs> District 7. An example of some of our work this last few years include, but not limited, the portrait of a graduate, food for families, logistics during the pandemic, vaccination efforts, uh, and uh, in regards to outreach to both Bensonville taxing bodies are stronger as well. Uh, both Bensonville and Wooddale taxing bodies. Taxing bodies include uh, the park district, the library, the police department, the fire department, and the villages. In addition, our ties with the Chamber of Commerce of both Bensonville and Wooddale, Wooddale is very strong. Communication is important for the sex of our district and we continue to improve upon it. Securing the future, Bruce? Sure, just a couple of things. Um, as it says, they're aligning the annual budget to support the goals um, of this strategic plan. Um, and really, we're you know, making an investment. The budget is, is earmarked and, and uh, uh, developed to invest in all these things that we're kind of talking about and, and, and ensuring their success. Um, one of the goals I guess I want to talk about uh, and, and tasks that we've completed and, and I think the existing board members know what this is and, and the other new ones will learn more about it, um, but was the completion of our facility assessment survey. Um, I guess that was, was that two years ago already? That was two years uh, ago. Two years, it seemed so long ago. Two and a half. Um, mm -hmm. But it really was an assessment of the district's entire uh, building facilities inside and out um, to provide really a baseline of where we're at and to help us make decisions going forward uh, with, with that. So we're uh, pleased and excited about bringing more information to you about that. Um, we've remained, we believe, fiscally responsible. You've helped uh, support us very well in terms of balanced budgets and approving our budgets and, and initiatives. So uh, we're grateful for a supportive board to make that happen. Um, and then, you know, the recruitment, uh, the selection, development, of, and retaining effective professional staff. Um, I think we've made great strides with that. Dr. Benson may want to touch on that a little bit more, but uh, we've made some great uh, areas of, of uh, yeah, progress there. Right, we've been emphasizing a diverse staff and we've had a good hiring season, so to speak, and that we've been able to attract good candidates here. So we're pleased with that. Bruce forgot to say that he's had a balanced badge budget for the last four years. So yeah. shout out to you, buddy. <laughs> Not alone. Okay. So, ready? Yep. Uh, so, uh, following up on that, uh, what's next? Uh, where do we go from here? We finalized that plan. Part of tonight is, is finalizing that plan and letting you know what we've done and how we've done it. Um, the fall c coming up, uh, we're going to be working on beginning the, uh, the next three years, the next uh, strategic plan, and, and set that um, in place uh, for the 21 22. Um, school year to start and that will continue for the next three years. Uh, something that's that's interesting and we've heard some of this tonight um, is some results of some things some work that we've done over the last uh, several years that will really help inform that plan. I think we're in a much better situation coming into this strategic plan than we were on the previous one because we've done as Bruce just mentioned a comprehensive facility evaluation. We know exactly what how this building, uh, what its status is and what needs to be done and how that may impact uh, our planning for the next three years. A portrait of a graduate, for those of you who were involved in that, that really sets the tone for what our community expectation is for what our graduates look and, and are like <coughs> as they leave Fenton. It's really defining what that end result is uh, and, and how our students 
um, uh, grow as, as a result of this. And that was actually done in conjunction with our center district. So that's really a, a long range uh, uh, portrait that they, they looked at. And then the equity uh, audit and action plan. It's not uh, so ironic that there's some uh, actions in the strategic plan that were also mirrored in the equity plan in that the recruiting practices and things such as that, that really these will come together and really meld into a very nice strategic plan for the next three years, having gone through all this analysis and this understanding of these, uh, these three programs. So. Thanks, Jim. Yep. Just once again to reiterate to the board, it was a three-year journey. It was a lot of work. There was 82 action plans there as well. And what's, beauty, what's the beauty of a, a strategic plan is like the North Star, where we want to go as a district, so everyone knows where we're going. And uh, looking forward to, to strategic plan 2.0. Coming up next here is the uh, ESSER grant update. We're doing this every board meeting, so we're all on the same page in regards to what ESSER grant is up to, what we're spending the money on, and so forth. I'm going to turn over to Mike to Bruce. Sure. Uh, there are three grants, as we uh, mentioned in, in past meetings, um, one, two, and three grants, uh, or F, I guess, is S or F is uh, kind of the third grant. Um, this year is the going to be pretty much the bulk of the S or one grant at $186,000. There might be some small carryover in the next year. Um, and then the other two grants will be budgeted. Um, S or two likely will be budgeted the entire amount next year. And in ESSER 3, we have a couple of years to spend that three years, so that'll be budgeted in phases over that uh, period of time. So uh, when the budget is um, brought to you uh, next month to review the tentative budget, it will include these items. So there'll be an impact to the budget. You'll see uh, some bigger line items um, in some areas uh, as a result of the, of the ESSER funding. Um, and just briefly, um, what we've done uh, with, with the funds, the, the first allocation, um, we've, uh, our staff, uh, we've used for, uh, uh, professional development and this, a lot of this happened last summer and it's continuing this summer as well. Uh, PPE supplies, cleaning equipment, uh, miscellaneous equi equipment and supplies, technology items, um, all those things, um, were funded with, uh, uh ESSER funds or a good portion of them were. Um, we also uh, purchased some additional furniture, so that's in, in, in transit right now. That purchase order has been submitted. Um, so that's for next year. Uh, chair, desks, chairs, um, also uh, furniture for our uh, learning labs um, throughout the uh, building. Uh, new personnel, we'll talk about that, I think, later on in the personnel report. You'll see that. Just uh, for clarification, learning labs like chemistry, biology, those learning labs, or what learning labs? Michelle? Oh, so we're creating um, four new learning labs throughout the building. Um, two of them will be content specific areas like a math lab and a writing reading lab. Um, the other labs will be for either exhibition of project based learning um, or just in the kind of um, blended learning spaces where when students are not required to be in their particular classrooms. They have spaces that are comfortable to go learn independently and create some of their <coughs> products for their classes. Um, so they're really just nice, comfortable, independent learning labs. They'll all have support with tutors. Um, that's part of the new personnel um, where we have cer certified staff to support students who go into those labs and might need assistance. Um, particularly in the math and the reading and writing labs. So they're going to be brand new spaces. We're taking over the old study hall rooms. We're taking over an old um, fat computer lab. We're pulling the computers out. It's about time. Um, and then a 302, 304, um, that main space that fronts the, um, the cafeteria. You can kind of see through the glass. Um, that space and then we're pulling out some locker banks and just creating some soft seating and some tables and chairs um, so there's just um, comfortable spaces um, instead of the lockers that sometimes aren't used by our students either way. Will there be computers in the learning labs or no? Uh, no, all, every one of our students has a Chromebook okay. so um, we, don't, we don't see a need for it. And la 
lastly, the ionization project, which is underway, the board approved that a couple of meetings ago, so that project uh, is happening as we speak, and um, it will be done be prior to the start of school. Thank you, Bruce. Next slide, we just a real quick uh, COVID-19 metrics and vaccination update, which we've heard uh, great news. We're in moderate. The arrows are pointing in the right direction. I believe we were at 2.95% uh, 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 COVID rate uh, across two page, which is very low. Um, so hopefully that trend goes. Uh, next slide there is, this is just real quick. I showed a slide, everything. I mean, you can see the trend right there. It's, it's almost uh, all the way to zero there from what I can see here. So great, great trends. Vaccination, like what uh, Rick re uh, reported earlier, uh, we had 10 events, about 7,000 uh, 7, individuals received vac uh, a vaccine. Partners include Jewel Osco, District 2, District 7, the Villages, Woodella, and Bensonville Taxing Bodies, and St. Alexis, to name a few. Next slide, we have, uh, we received two FOIAs I reported uh, for public requests, one from the product analysis team of smart procurement requested all of, all of the contact information of Fenton staff uh, that has been uh, completed. And the next FOIA was uh, through the Chicago Regional C Council of Carpenters and requests. They were requesting for information regarding Fenton's contract and subcontract for the fiscal year 2019. That is it for our report. Okay, thank Mr. you. President. Thank you. Uh, let's get to consent agendas. Sure. Just real quick in the consent agenda, uh, uh, just just wanted to point out we added a addendum which you guys all received. We have a resignation um, with our assistant superintendent of of uh, HR and operations that's inserted there. We received a resignation yesterday. We would like to include that in the consent agenda. Um, and as um, we said earlier, uh, there the ESSER grant is also there which includes the furniture per, for, uh, purchase. We had, uh, we had to amend the 2021-2022 school calendar. As you know, as I reported uh, last time, uh, we are switching uh, late start to Monday. Um, so Monday's moving next uh, school year. Uh, students will start at what time, Michelle? 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Uh, that will give us time to do our professional development instead of Tuesday afternoon. Uh, Monday morning and kids come in a little later. Okay, let's look at the financial reports. Uh, that, that is a consent. Oh, it is. Okay. Okay. Uh, do we have any questions or comments regarding the amended consent agenda? Uh, so I may have a motion to approve the amended consent agenda as presented. So move. Roll call, please. Wiedemann? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Page? Yes. Jalowicz? Yes. Radinsky? Yes. Rago? Yes. Sing Popong? Yes. Uh, we have a uh, motion passed. So thank you. And uh, we're going to the discussion items, action items. Uh, Fenton Local Organization of Support. Uh, for staff floss, please, James. Sure. Floss, as we know, we've been working under negotiations for the last four months. Um, they have ratified the, uh, the tentative agreement, as I reported earlier. Um, it's your chance right now to we recommend that you approve the contract. I sent the board a clean copy of the contract as well as an edited version. Um, we have met all of our requirements that was uh, given to us, followed the, the board's directive. We are very proud of that, and we recommend that the board approve this this new contract with our non-certified staff. Okay, uh, any questions about that discussion? Okay, uh, may I have a motion that the Board of Education approve the 2021-2024 contractual agreement between the Fenton Local Organization of uh, Support Staff and the Board of Education as presented? I'll make that motion. Second. Okay, uh, may I have, uh, can I get a roll call? Wiedemann? Yes. Aid? Yes. Jalowicz? Yes. <coughs> Redzinski? Yes. Rago? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Sinkopong? Yes. Uh, motion passed. 
Next is the textbook purchases. Michelle? Yes. Um, so in your packet, I've, I've provided um, you all an overview summary of our new textbook purchases for next school year, as well as a detailed summary. Um, each year, we review our resources and determine what kind of new, new resources do we need, which ones do we maintain, um, what additional um, items are, are, are necessary. And we um, uh, have gotten to our end of life on our social studies textbooks. Um, when I say end of life, these are now digital resources, so they give us six year subscriptions or seven year, depending on the digital ebook. And we've come to the end of our six years on our social studies book, so we are going to go ahead and purchase another six years. Um, we're using the same social studies textbooks as we had. We reviewed them. We thought we think they're quality. Um, they're, they serve their purpose. Um, they're through reputable publishers, and we are going to move forward with, um, a, w with your approval. Um, our textbooks for U.S. history and world history. Um, you might notice, and you'll see this again in the math um, line, that um, I have a total cost and estimated shipping for fiscal year 22, fiscal year 23, oh, and that should say fiscal year 24. So th because of the amount of these textbooks, we defer the cost over multiple years so we don't get hit heavy any one particular year. Um, so this year, we're deferring the costs of our social studies and math textbooks, um, and, uh, and um, we've maintained um, a total cost of the purchase for this year at 66000 which is kind of uh, right in the middle. We've had anywhere from 80000 to, you know, um, down to fifty, sometimes 40000 for our annual new textbooks. So we're, we're kind of right in the middle there with that strategy. Um, for applied technology, that's uh, really uh, in the small engines, that's the same situation. Um, it's a, a textbook that we've used for years and it just needs to be updated. Um, and it, it's time, it, so it's the same publisher, same title, it's just another six years. And this one's actually in an ebook format now. So, um, and with each of those, we do purchase some classroom sets. So if some students learn better with having it in their hands, we purchase those and have classroom sets available. Um, so, so who who is uh, the math? Who are the math books by? So that I was just going to talk about the math. Oh, so, okay. Sorry. No, that's okay because um, applied tech and um, at social studies were just kind of like renewals. Um, math is new. So this is a new resource for us, but we have, we actually did use them this year in our college algebra and pre-calc courses, and we found them to be um, a very strong resource. Um, as, as some of you know, we've been using uh, Khan Academy as um, a resource, so this kind of moves us uh, in a different direction. Um, we might still use Khan Academy to um, help students who have, uh, identify gaps in their learning, but this would become our primary resource. So um, CPM is uh, a, a resource that it focuses on collaborative learning, problem-based learning, and mixed space practice. So that means they um, constantly spiral those skills back in and students see them multiple times, not just one and done. Um, and uh, it's, um, been around for a while. Our, I, I actually had a couple of teachers who wanted to come talk about it, but a family emergency came. And they, they we went through a, a pretty rigorous process and we vetted um, a few, uh, three uh, resources in particular. We had a rubric, we said, how does, how does this align to our competencies? Because as you all, some of you might know, uh, integrated math is a newer math sequence for us. We used to have Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2. Now we have Integrated Math 1, Math 2, and Math 3. So this is the resource that will support that um, new sequence. Um, we're excited about it. Um, I have more information if you'd, you'd want it. So is um, it an actual book or is it a, is 
the technology? It's technology based. Yeah, so um, they'll open their Chromebooks and be able to see everything on their Chromebooks. But again, we'll have classroom sets. Um, and at least, because in this particular model, they actually work in pods. So they're almost always working collaboratively in a group of four. So we purchased enough for every group of four to have a paper copy. So there is some sort of it's paper copies that they can look at. Yes. Too. Yes. That always seems to be yes. an issue because there's not like a, something for them to actually have. Like it always seems to be on a computer, not something that they can actually go back and refer to. In the book. Yeah. No. Every group will have paper to work from. Mm -hmm. There's also um, like algebra tiles that they'll be working with and manipulatives. But yeah. Yes. Um, they will have the opportunity to work in their notebooks and work together to problem solve. Is that it, the same for the U.S. history and world history books as oh well? Oh yeah, I, I think collaboration is kind of a foundation in most of our courses, um, but in, in those particular textbooks, it's a textbook, so okay. the teacher is creating those opportunities. This particular curricular resources grounds themselves in those practices. So they not only give you the text, but they also give you the associated teaching strategies to go along with it. So they're you know, trying to foster student autonomy, engage them in dialogue and inquiry. Um, students construct meaning from multiple math concepts, not just solve a problem and move on. Um, and, and they show their understanding through performance tasks, not just uh, multiple choice tests at the end of a unit or at the end of a textbook. So it's quite different than what they've been experiencing over the last couple of years. But you know, basically this is a, a consistent with the, the change in methodology of education. Yes. And so this will support all those things coming. How does it, if you look at it as a, a six year commitment, um, does it, does it evolve every year? To, for example, you know how you have like software updates, stuff yes. like that. D does it update on its own over the course of six years then? Yes, every, if, if okay. there's, that's the great thing about the okay. e-text is we don't have to work with sure. outdated textbooks for six years before we can buy a new one. They regularly update content irregularities or um, things like that. And you know, obviously, it, does this uh, require any uh, um, training or development for instructors, instructional? Yes, they're all engaging in it this summer. Okay. Um, so depending on which course they're in, they're in specific workshops for those courses. And they have some time to um, do curriculum development alongside of it, become acquainted with the program. So that was last board okay. meeting with the Thank curriculum you. hours. Mm -hmm. So Kit asked about it's a updating so it updates annually. So if there's something, like for instance in world history and US history, uh, there would be an update, so you wouldn't be stuck with the same six, the same thing for six years. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. And I don't think they're going to make major changes. You know, like rewrite the table of contents and and you know rework the whole book, um, but they will do updates. Right. Like if you had a science book, an e-book, and they said this planet is no longer a planet. Right. Mm -hmm. The next year they would take that planet out. Who's the, uh, the U.S. history? Um, hold on, I have I have to look. Is that um, the U.S. Uh, Hoffman Milfen and and McGraw Hill. Okay. Pretty standard published. Um, any other any other questions? Can I just ask one more thing about the math? Will they be able to take anything home with them? Because they collaboratively work at home, at school, but when they're doing work at home, then they're on their own. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I'm, I sat in those presentations, and I believe there'll be independent practice involved. Okay. Mm -hmm. <coughs> independent practice, you mean like they take, won't they be able, they, they don't take a book home. They, it's well, all online. It'll, yeah, it'll be on their computer, but ju just because it's not, they're not always answering like on the computer. They might have to do it in their notebook alongside of what their what the problem looks like on their screen. Mm -hmm. um, but what, by independent practice, I mean they're not doing it with the group this time. This time they have to show that they can do it by themselves, um, depending on what the problem is. Right. And I can 
I can get more information for you and connect you with the teachers who have been using it. They're, like I said, they're very enthusiastic about it. And um, they, they really like the change in this um, pedagogy from, I'm gonna sit on a computer, answer problems, and work at my own pace, to I'm gonna go ahead and collaborate and work through real, authentic types of problems <coughs> together. You know, I, I see where that's valuable, but I st also that learning those concepts and get yes. making those concrete, yes, and then bringing them to the group, you know. So they'll still be a place for digitalized learning like Khan, but it'll be more explicit and directed. So it'll the the teachers can identify a gap in learning for a student and say, "Ooh, it seems like you're really struggling with the percentages on this one. I want you to go practice this on Khan, right?" Or um, based so you're still on utilizing Khan Academy yeah, and just, for that. Yeah, as a supplemental resource. Have you have you surveyed the kids about Khan Academy? <laughs> We've heard <laughs> they don't they don't necessarily love it. They do not necessarily love it. You are right about yeah. that. <laughs> We've this is as far as we got with the curricular resources for this year. We are going to look, and we actually have already started looking at other digital resources that are more of that, um, what, how do I say it? The, um, that immediate feedback, that automated uh, feedback where you don't need a teacher, the, the computer program will give you that automated feedback. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at other digital programs besides. Well, let's just get rid of the teachers if everything's automated. Well, that's why we're getting CPM. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, I am totally kidding. No. <laughs> we know you were kidding. <laughs> um, okay. The other, the other, I'm sorry, I, I just keep racking my brain on this. So, you know, going back to COVID, right? Going back to maybe what we went through and what we learned from it. Um, and uh, this has been on my mind too is, you know, we have COVID 20, uh, 19, right? But let's say that there's a COVID 22, 24, how does this curriculum in the next six years um, consider that? So they were able to manage it in both of our pre-calculus and our college algebra courses. So they found a way to, to make it work, um, especially with breakout groups on Google uh, Meets and Zoom. So the students were still engaging in collaborative problem solving and dialogue. So it didn't really stop them completely. I'm sure they had to make adjustments and modify, but it's doable. It's important to note that most of our classes have multiple resources, not just one text that they work from. They're bringing in a variety of resources to help students learn. Thank, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. A any other questions, guys? Okay. okay. Uh, then, May I have a motion that the Board of Education approve the new textbook purchase for 2021-2022 school year as presented? Okay, hang on a second. So I said, so why don't we get rid of the teachers? And you said, that's why we're bringing in CPM. To not, to, to get away from the fully automated feedback. Okay, all yes. right, because I'm like, wait, 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 wait. No, <laughs> no, to get away from that fully automated experience, okay. right? So, uh, although it wasn't a truly fully automated experience, there were teachers making screencasts and supporting students in small groups, but to the students it felt like a fully automated mm -hmm. experience. Like that's, they were teaching themselves right. with So Khan CPM Academy. moves us away from that a bit further where we could still utilize that where necessary, but the primary form of methodology is collaborative, discussion-based, kids working together not in isolation in front of a computer And screen. they are still getting the concepts of algebra and geometry and trig, mm -hmm. and they yes. will walk away with that pro with proficiency. Absolutely, yes. Sorry. No, don't be, no. Any, anything else? Discussions, any other questions? Okay. Uh, may I have a roll call? Uh, no. That the Board of Education approved the new textbook purchase for 2021. 2022 uh, school year as presented. So moved. I'll second. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, may I have a roll call, please? Wiedemann? Yes. Galloway? Yes. Radzinski? Yes. Rago? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. 
Cade? Yes. Team Popon? Yes. And uh, motions passed. Uh, can we take a look at the consumer materials, please? Sure. Um, and uh, every year, we, like I said, we look at our materials and our resources. And um, besides textbooks, we use a number of other resources. Um, some of those are consumables like workbooks or consumable supplies like binders and such. Um, so um, we replace those in certain courses every year. Um, so in your packet, you have an overview summary of consumable materials and then a detail summary of consumable materials as well as textbook replenishment. So in the textbook replenishment, we're looking at um, either materials that have been damaged, not returned, or because of a change in enrollment in the course, let's say the enrollment increased in an elective course, we have to be able to provide every student the material that goes along with that course, so we have to purchase those if we don't already have them in our inventory. So we're looking um, for uh, workbooks at a cost of 6,800 approximately, uh, consumable supplies, approximately uh, $700. Those are usually purchased out of Title I. And then our textbook <coughs> replenishment at about $11,000, um, between eleven dollars and $12,000. Who's reading The House of Spirits? Um, it looks like our academic literacy course is The House of Spirits. Where do you see that one? Second from the bottom. Oh, okay. AP English. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, may I have a motion that the Board of Education approve the 2021 22 consumable materials and textbook replenishment proposal as presented? Hmm. I'll make the motion. You have a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, roll call, please. Wiedemann? Yes. Redzinski? Yes. Rago? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Hayes? Yes. Galwick? Yes. Team Popong? Yes. And motion passed. Uh, let's take a look at consolidated grants. This is mine too. <laughs> um, I, have a, I have a very busy um, June. So every year um, we submit a number of grants um, to t start at our new fiscal year and um, we write um, a consolidated district plan. And this plan um, encompasses a number of federal <coughs> grants in which we apply for every year. Um, this grant um, or this consolidated district plan was put into effect by the Illinois State Board of Education to bring together multiple funding sources. It's one system to ensure that the grants are aligned and that they're focused on equity. There's one set of questions that I have to answer that applies to almost every federal grant that we get. Well at least educationally related. Um, so uh, you will see in this 18 page handout that I have, it's just a summary of the grant at 18 pages, <laughs> it's not even the whole one, um, that we, uh, within this consolidated grant, we address Title I, which the one goal of Title I is to assist to schools in meeting educational goals of low income students. Um, we support Title II, which is essentially professional development and ensuring um, high quality teachers, principals, and school leaders. Title III, which supports our language instruction for students who are English language learners or immigrant students. Our Title IV, which su um, supports um, student academic enrichment programs, um, typically um, use of technology or improving school conditions. Um, and then I, IDEA, which is the Individual Disability Education Act, Part B flow through. So that affects our students who are in special education programming. 
These are our estimated allotments for this year in each of those grants. Um, it looks like 274,000 approximately in Title I, approximately 42,000 in Title II, 34,000 in Title III, Title IV will be 21,000. It's very likely we will transfer our Title IV funding into Title I. The reason for that is Title IV targets, it, targets something very specific that Title I also targets but it doesn't provide us as many limitations. So we go ahead and we transfer those funds into Title I to allow us a little bit more flexibility with those funds if we need it. What are the, the, the specific things that it targets, Title IV? Yeah, so Title IV targets a well-rounded educational experience and improving school conditions and the use of technology, which Title I also represents and which we use the funding for that. It's a very common strategy among schools to transfer those funds. Um, and then in IDEA, we have about 332,000. And it's acceptable to move yeah. funds like, I know in my past life, yeah. there was no bit forbidden. Yeah, we but do that every that, year. Okay, I just yeah. wanna make sure we're No, we're fine. I assume we were, but I, <laughs> I'm surprised to hear we could kind of do that. It's nice, don't get yeah. me wrong. It's yeah. just, it's, you, a, it's a pleasant surprise. You can move it some ways, but not other ways, but that's one particular oh, oh, way that okay. allows us to have more leverage in how we use our funding. It's, it's a pleasant surprise. Yes. <laughs> um, although we end up using a lot of it for technology and well-rounded education and, you know, impro improving um, the conditions of the school either way. So um, in the summary of responses, all of the, that 18-page document I provided you includes all of these areas on this particular slide. Um, I'll provide a brief overview of each of the areas. Um, the first one, um, ISBE asks us to describe the steps that will be taken to overcome barriers to equitable program participation of students, teachers, and other beneficiaries with special needs. So I really point my arrows at this equity audit and this equity um, action planning that we've done this year um, as a rationale for how we will um, overcome those barriers. We look at our EOS data and um, at the, uh, the professional development we've been doing in the area of equity as well. Just for some acronyms there, ISBE stands for Illinois State Board of Education, EOS stands for Equal Opportunity School, those were what I quickly saw. Thank you. Yeah. I'll, I will get better at that for you, John. <laughs> um, yep, just, just the new guy, got questions. No, now. Thank no, you. it's fair. We <laughs> use, we use so there many acronyms. So the Illinois State Board of Education asks us in every one of these areas to consider which of these three goals we align with. Is it aligned to student learning? Is it aligned to learning conditions? Or is it aligned to educator quality? So in nearly every one of these areas, we align in all three of those goals. Um, they ask us about our stakeholders and how we conducted the needs assessment for how we'll spend in these grants. And I, I, again, point to the district equity audit, other data resources like our access testing, we do IEP surveys, we um, have stakeholder feedback surveys and focus groups. I have an annual Title I meeting where I solicit student, or I'm sorry, um, parent feedback. In the next section, they ask about student achievement. They, um, I, I go ahead and prove that we have a well-rounded instructional program a system to identify students at risk of failure, educational assistance for students in need, strategies to improve academic and language programs, um, that we have effective experienced high quality teachers, that we have a highly effective library program and we develop digital literacy skills and that we serve our gifted and talented students. So all of those areas are addressed in the grant. The next area is the college and career. In that area, we focus on of the transition um, of our students from eighth grade into high school, as well as high school into post-secondary settings. We focus on our CTE programming, as well as our workplace experiences for students. In the next section, we focus on professional development. Um, all of these areas, um, including <coughs> curriculum and instruction, assessment, special education, English language learners, social emotional learning, equity, 
career readiness, tech and rich learning, and blended learning, restorative practices, everything you hear us talk about, this is what we put into this area right here. We also prove out that a uh, safe learning environment and our steps towards social emotional learning, having um, fair and safe discipline procedures, that we address bullying, and that we support our students uh, in a homeless status. Um, our Title I specific requirements are asked to be outlined. These are the ways that we typically use our funding from Title I. Chromebooks and calculators, professional development, school-wide assessment programs, summer school salaries, flexible learning environments and furniture, experiential learning with co within college and career settings, tech and rich learning, equal opportunity schools, and parent involvement. And then um, IDEA specific requirements. There's, these are our special education programming initiatives around social emotional learning, transition practices, <coughs> behavioral planning, multi-systems of support, multi-tiered systems of support. And finally, they ask us to, to talk to um, how we um, support students who enter or who are part of foster care. So we, we talk about our procedures within um, that area and how we manage to keep them here or move them onto other settings depending on the transitions and the mobility in their life. So the, the final part of the grant summary is the board approval, certifications, and assurances. Um, so we submit this plan with your approval so we can move on and apply for those five grants. So we write this plan, now we're gonna write the applications for each of those grants. But we can't do that until we approve this plan. And in this packet, there are also the assurances that are essentially like our terms and conditions. It ensures that we're gonna monitor and track our funds appropriately and those types of things. So what I'm asking for tonight is um, a, a motion to please approve the fiscal year 2022 consolidated district plan. So and do, um, you said you have to write each of the grants. They don't. You can't just do it one time and it, and submit it to every everyone. No, you have to write the rationale and answer all of the questions regarding regarding which. Yep. And, the, and now I have to enter into each of the uh, applications and and complete the applications. Um, I have a question regarding um, when you were. Um, talking about the equity-driven programming. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that you had said about adopting cultural res uh, responsive teaching standards, uh, use it in the Board of Education standards, how current are those standards? How, I mean, do they annually? Uh, so actually they're brand new this year. Okay. So they're, the Illinois State Board of Education just approved them a couple of months ago, or at least within this school year. Okay. So I assume that there'll be updates regularly to them, yeah. but as of right now, this is our first year okay. experiencing them. Okay, thank you. Uh, if there's no other questions or uh, comments, uh, may I have a motion that the board approve the Illinois State Board of Education fiscal year 2022 consolidated grant district plan Fenton Community High School District 100 as presented. I'll make a motion. Second. Thank you. Roll call, please, Mary. Wiedemann? Yes. Rago? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Paid? Yes. Jalowitz? Yes. Redzinski? Yes. Ting Paul Pong? Yes. Motion passed. School bus purchases. Okay. Um, Michelle, do you want to take this one? Give <laughs> 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 me some water. She's doing a great job. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, sorry about that. That's okay. Um, so tonight uh, we're asking for approval to move forward with the bus, uh, two bus purchases. Um, currently, uh, our, we have uh, we entered into a five-year lease in 2016 that is going to end next month. And at the time when we entered into that lease, we knew we would have options at the end of the lease, uh, whether we wanted to trade them in and get newer buses, um, extend the lease, purchase the existing buses, and so on. So 
we did evaluate all those options and, and just to kind of take you back a few years back at, at this time when we this was our first lease we entered into um, the, the bus uh, the transportation fund really was um, the expenditures were far outpacing the revenue so we you know a new bus is anywhere from 60 to 80 eighty five thousand dollars so at that time we felt leasing was the best option for us and, and it still is serving us well um, but we think at this point in time um, you know, to control costs at that time, just going back for just one moment, um, we, we had to do something. Our fleet was aging. We needed to, you know, replace some buses. Our best option at that time, um, after kind of reviewing all, all different pieces, um, was, the, was the lease buses. So we, so we did that. We entered into a lease. It's, it's worked out well. Um, and uh, our leasing partner we've been with, with Midwest Transit, it's, it's, it's uh, been a good relationship. We still are responsible for maintaining the buses. We do it that in-house, so we have a mechanic in-house that, that does a great job. Um, our mechanic of many years retired last year, but we uh, hired a fellow that probably is just as good um, now that, that uh, does a fine job out there with our bus uh, fleet. So, uh, as I said, these are 2015 buses, as, as we've written in there. Um, we we would, uh, are recommending to uh, purchase these buses. They're 72 passenger capacity. Um, they're about in the low 40,000 uh, 40, mile range. Um, the bodies are in great condition. Our kids, by the way, are working out there washing our buses, <laughs> waxing our buses. So if you get an opportunity, want to tour the bus yard, feel free, because they look phenomenal. They look brand new. So they, I was out there the other day, and they, they do a really a tremendous job. Um, so the purchase price is, is that 29982 and then there's a license fee to add, add into that. So um, we are recommending um, to purchase these two buses at, the, uh, at this point in time. We've had a, a favorable year. Our expenses have been lower than the normal. Uh, we probably kind of know why that's happening. Um, so we think this is an opportune time to, to purchase them. Uh, we would still do that out of this year's budget if the, if the board is agreeable to move forward with that purchase. So um, that's what we're asking for approval for tonight. New guy question, sorry. No, go right ahead. On the fleet, we own all the other buses. We've leased these two, correct? We don't. We lease about seven altogether. So, how many buses do we have in our fleet? About 21, 20. 22. We're leasing seven. These two are coming off lease. It's our chance to purchase. Correct. Okay. Yes. Do we have a regular replace? Uh, have we put in a regular replacement plan for our fleet? Pretty much every year, we like to make a decision whether we're going to lease some or. But we want to maintain the fleet um, at, at the level that we have now. Um, but we're evaluating buses every year. Um, Whether it be a mechanical issue or just yeah. age, mileage, I and mean, what standards do we work on as far as replacement? Age and miles and, and, and condition of the body, yeah. Have we experienced issues with the new emissions on our buses? Um, An increase in maintenance costs. I mean, we're stuck with them. I'm just curious. Right. I, I don't think any more than, than what we've been experiencing. I mean, they've, they're, you know, they have the newest technology. Um, it's not always good, but yes, yeah. we're stuck with it. We aren't using biodiesel, um, but we are using, you know, <laughs> diesel. Another set you of can't issue. stick corn down the tank. <laughs> <laughs> We've tried. Just, it just doesn't work. Questions. I'm just trying to keep yeah. up the speed here. No, it's, it's fair. Big, big, big picture. So are these the buses we were leasing? They are. They yes. are. So we're just basically buying them now. They gave us a proposal for newer buses to lease, but it was about $20,000 more a bus. And we just didn't feel like that was um, a, a good use of our uh, funds. We, we think we can keep these for at least five more years, um, if not longer, um, the, the, uh, based on the condition they're in and the way we maintain them. I'm sorry, what was the, the lease cost? The lease cost was about, uh, for this lease, was about $8,500 a year for per bus. So about $17,000. And you said under the lease, we do the maintenance? We do, yes. So that's why the lease is so low. It's not on Yeah, public. and sometimes um, uh, they are still covered under warranty as you, well. The manufacturer so warranty. Yeah. 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 Okay. So that's whether we buy it or not, it's the manufacturer warranty. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's What's the lease length specifically? Uh, the ones we've entered into have been five years. Five years. Yeah. So 
Is there a way to lease these buses for five more years at 85, or are they just going to put? They would. Yeah, we asked that, that the price would go up about 12 percent. Okay. So that's and, that's why you said 20,000, right? 20, Pardon 17. me. 17,000. But, but but you're saying that if the lease um, price, the cost of the lease is going to go up by 12 percent. Yeah. If we, if we renewed the lease. If we renewed it, yes. Okay. There's no other full questions. Okay, uh, and they have a motion that the Board of Education approve the purchase of two 2015 school buses for a price of thirty thousand hundred ninety-four, includes license and title fees per bus from Midwest Transit Equipment. The total purchase will be sixty thousand three hundred eighty-eight dollars. That will be paid from uh, the 2020-2021 budget year. I'll make a motion. I'll second that. Thank you. Uh, may I have a roll call? Wiedemann? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Hayde? Yes. Jalowick? Yes. Redlinski? Yes. Rago? Yes. Ting Pong? Yes. Motion passed. Okay, can we talk about student program and uh, studies and related student fees? Yes, thank you. Uh, so at your, your table, there is a copy of the student program of studies and right there. Uh, we could move to the next slide, please. So the reason this came up, this originally came up and was approved by the board, and obviously we had new board members now, so it's a process of acclimating people. So this, gu this guide was approved December 16th, 2020 at a board meeting. That's why we also have a copy at your table. Since then, we have had a discussion about related course fees and, par and course fees and other fees. And so we, through many discussions, uh, decided to eliminate what, what I'll refer to as our internal course fees. And um, this was discussed at our May 4 uh, board meeting, which was actually pushed back from the, it was really the April board meeting. So when we say internal course fees eliminated, we need, we, we are saying any course fees of, of typical courses that you would see throughout this guide, and then at the bottom we would say there was a, a course fee. So those have, have been eliminated, which is what we're recommending for approval tonight. Just to be clear, it does not include a course that's like a tuition course like through a college or university uh, that's still listed uh, as, a, as a fee there, as a tuition fee, and also any TCD program fees, which again, it's not an internal fee, that's through TCD, that's a program fee that they charge. So those, those fees, although they may vary from course to course at TCD, that also we're not recommending to eliminate those court those internal type course fees um, and then the, and then we had mentioned at the board meeting a 10 percent reduction of registration fees across the board we had mentioned that uh, for freshmen it's a little higher uh, and and then sophomore juniors and seniors just for some extra uh, fees involved in that so that's what we are asking for, for recommendation tonight So fees are going down? Course fees are being eliminated, uh, kind okay. of for two reasons, quite honestly, because of COVID and our experiences and recovering from that uh, uh, as far as the finances in the community. And also, we had gotten feedback from our staff that it's an equity issue as far as kids may not sign up for a particular course if it had a fee attached to it. and. We, we went through the numbers and, and fiscally speaking, we, you know, we think that's something that we can manage um, and we wanna take that out of the equation for our kids as they're signing up for courses here at Fenton. How does that impact, let's say the bottom line then, by charging these fees before and not, and it, you know, moving forward and not charging these fees now? I mean. Yeah, uh, I don't know <clears throat> if I, yeah, I don't know. It's, about it's roughly about thirty-five thousand dollars. Yeah. Thirty-five thousand dollars. Yeah, the okay. fees, right? For for just the internal fee 
fees that we charge. Uh, how many students do you think that that applies to that wouldn't sign up for a course because of a course fee? I mean, that's kind of impossible to tell. Like I said, it's anecdotal feedback, but at the same time, you know, we don't want that to be a potential barrier for, for anybody. Can you, like, uh, and, and, and I would also add, many of these fees were sort of arbitrary numbers that we came up with years ago. And so over time, curriculum has changed. Uh, you know, we feel like we're in a position where we don't necessarily have to make a student pay for something that, that it's something added within a course that's here at Fenton, so. And does that also include the 10% reduction of registration fees? Is that in that 30 That's what I put in, also? just related fees, because that's really the other area. Uh, we kind of took a look at other fees, like like parking we didn't touch, you know, some other fees we, we chose not to, that we would keep the same. So these were like, the ones that we okay, focused it's, on. It's been a few years, so like, Registration fees, course fees, what course? Any it's course? like culinary used to have a 10 or $15 fee with it. Maybe your autos course would yeah, have woods. something. Yeah. A lot of your career and technical art. education so courses. So the, the, yeah. the, art, the art extracurricular fees. stuff, like arts, art, and? Electives, electives, electives. extra yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. Which are very important to our community. I mean, we know that there's a push in our community and with this board in particular to not just focus on AP, but CTE classes like your wood, yeah, your art. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we gotta get we don't more kids put into up the trades. Borders and then, hey, look, I don't have 15 bucks. I know that's yeah. minimal, but there's just families that just can't afford 15 bucks. <coughs> so the big question is this reduction can be absorbed by our bottom line without impacting moving forward. So that we're, we're not affecting, we're not going into savings. This, we can absorb this. Right, yes. that's okay. the calculus right. we made. That's right. part one. So we've eliminated the internal fees that we can control. But TCD, they have separate fees, I get it. My son went there. Right. And the, the, the gorilla in the room, we're talking calc yeah. lately. We've right. been hearing this every day. Right. So my impression is from reading this now that I read it is because this is a U of I class as was stated, which I didn't know until tonight, this fee is applied by U of I. Okay. If we did teach it internally, would we be able to eliminate the fee? And I'm not looking to change anything. I'm looking to learn. Is it feasible? So we can look moving forward, as we said, if this becomes a regular thing every year. And I don't expect to make a decision today. It's a question, I am the new guy. I am trying to learn all of this and make sense right. of it. I'm to, not to, here to To change. answer that U of I question, if we teach Calc 3, there is no tuition because that's part of our course. Because courses. it's yeah. part of ours correct. and one of our teachers are teaching it, but that's then correct. they lose the college credit out. No, no, no not if they take the AP exam. Yes or no? Actually, there still is a course fee associated, even if it's a dual credit. Um, it's not as much okay. as if it's a dual enrollment course like we have right now. Okay, so there's dual credit yes. and dual enrollment, so there's a difference, because I've heard both of those, yes. and I did not know the difference yeah. between them. The difference so this is what I'm trying to wrap my arms mm -hmm. around, because sure. I'm hearing different terms, and I'm not totally grasping what these terms mean, dual credit versus dual enrollment. Mm -hmm. And we are definitely aware and are, are, we have plans for how to create a dual credit when we have enough enrollment to do so, because it's not very typical we would run a class at five students and pay a teacher that amount of money to do that. Um, we also have teachers who are ready and willing to get that, um, that the training necessary, but not during a pandemic year. They weren't necessarily keen on that idea, and I don't blame them. Um, and then scholarships are available. And uh, I'm just, yeah. like I said, I'm trying to wrap my arms around dual yeah. enrollment, dual sure. credit, yeah. U of I, so there was and, and, and internal fees, because mm -hmm. this is a lot to take in in a couple of meetings. So I, yeah. I just want to make sure I have my mind in the right mm -hmm. place mm -hmm. when I formulate a decision. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a question regarding it also when we were discussing <coughs> equity and <coughs> programming uh, there was a mention about college credit courses that that being part of something that you <coughs> would consider how would that fall in line with it could definitely be one one area in which we would want to pursue the dual credit 
we have other opportunities, AP statistics that students can take as well, but we're pursuing it in other areas besides math, right? Um, and some of our CTE programming, um, some of our English programming, maybe that speech elective that you have to take your first two years of college, you know, areas like that. And if we, if, if we partner with the College of DuPage, we don't have expenses like U of I and some of those areas. But for now, we thought U of I was a very viable and strong option for the type of coursework <coughs> that we were trying to prepare students for and the type of students that we were preparing for. Mm -hmm. That helps, and Teddy, I didn't mean to cut you off. I was just trying to wrap my arms around it. I, sure. I, I was a kind of going, and I, I apologize if I was inappropriate. No, I'm just trying to fine. learn a lot in a short period of time, and I, I just wanted to apologize. But thank you. You answered my question. Yeah, also, a, a quick question. So, you know, I, I, I'm all for equity and accessibility, right? Um, in terms of um, you know, where, where that revenue is coming from, right? It's coming from the fees. Where was this being applied previously? What, what that you know thirty six thousand. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so yep, the the, the question point. is, um, so you, you look at um, the revenue coming in from these student fees. We we pull it out because um, we want to be more of an equitable, uh, accessible school in terms of these curriculums, right? So my my question then is, um, the thirty six thousand. Where was that being applied to before, in terms of spending? Well, it's all uh, accounted for in our local funds. So, um, I mean, the, the, it was an, uh, an offset of those progr programmatic uh, charges. This is basically gen general, general funds? Pardon me. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. And is there a time frame or is it just eliminated for a specific time or is it just? If, if we decide to put it back <coughs> um, and let's say we try to find a place, let's say, hey, look, there, there is a revenue issue we need to to increase tuition fees we would increase tuition fees but like what sam said earlier due to COVID, due to employment to the hardship in our community we found it apropos kind of like what we did with the parking permit we left that in but parking perm uh, per, uh, permit will be back next year yeah. when schools are back so we can make those changes year to year and i would i would just add if there is something it would probably be more targeted yes. so we're kind of cl clearing the decks if we do come up with some sort of course that, that for some reason is is a costly expense, then maybe we would try to assess a fee that would recoup at least part of that. There'd be a reason for that. Right, for that so particular we'll one. This year by year as budget changes, economy changes, input. Okay. Yeah, correct. Yep. I, I get it. Makes sense. Thank you for a lot of clarification. No, thanks. No, John. thanks. Good questions. questions. Yeah, good, good dialogue. Uh, if there's no other further questions, may I have a motion that the Board of Education approve the revisions to the annual student program of studies and related school fees? So I'll moved. make a motion. I'll second. Okay, thank you. Please, uh, roll call, please, Mary. Paul and Ms. Hayes. Wiedemann Hayes. Wiedemann. <coughs> Wiedemann? Yes. Hayes? Yes. Galloway? Yes. Radzinski? Yes. Rago? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Ching Paul Pong? Yes. Motion passed. A resolution of appointment of uh, uh, Dow's Board of Directors. James, please. Sure. This will be a quick one. Dow's is a fancy word for TCD, uh, Technology Center of DuPage. It's CTE, as you guys know, that's what we're targeting this, this year. Uh, TCD is composed of 14 school districts, one of them being Fenton. They have a Board of Education which is comprised of superintendents. This is just a, a, a motion to assign me as your superintendent to be a representative <coughs> of TCD. Okay, we're good. May I have a motion that the Board of Education approve the resolution to appoint uh, Superintendent James Ontenko as Fenton's representative for DuPage Area Occupational Education System, or DEOS, as presented. I'll make that motion. Wiedemann? Uh, yes. Galloway? Yes. Redzinski? Yes. Rago? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Page? Yes. King Paul Palm? Yes. Motion passed. Athletic training, uh, trainer agreement, Bruce? 
Yes, sir. Um, yes, before you have a proposal there of, a, of the bid results and what our recommendation is to move forward with an athletic trainer. And just some uh, background on this. Um, we had an athletic trainer pre-COVID um, that we were in the process of uh, looking at an extension to their contract. They wanted to increase it about 50%. Um, we didn't think that was reasonable. Um, they felt that strongly that it was a, a cost issue for them. They, they were losing money on the contract and so on. Uh, so that happened pri prior to COVID or just before COVID hit. Um, so when COVID uh, was here and, and, and you know, students were not at school, uh, we just kind of put it on pause there until we decided that, uh, we're going to decide what to do until we resume classes and, and, and uh, kids are back in the building. So um, we what we did then is we knew we didn't want to uh, absorb a 50% increase. Uh, we went out and bid, bid the uh, services. So um, we did receive two proposals. Um, we opened the bid a couple of weeks ago. Um, we bid it out for a three-year contract. We could extend it by one-year increments if we so choose. There is a 30-day cancellation clause in there, so if we aren't happy with services, we can walk away in 30 days, so if the board isn't locked into a, an automatic three-year deal, we can get out of it um, relatively easily. So the two proposals were from Rush Physical Therapy and Illinois Bone and Joint Institute, or IBJI. Uh, Rush was the low bidder. Um, we have checked references. Todd Becker, our athletic director, contacted local schools that use Rush that have been very happy. They've uh, received excellent uh, feedback from their references. Um, and IBJI is currently on board to kind of fill a short-term need. So that's, um, that, that they filled that short-term need for the spring season when things started to ramp up more. We needed to have an athletic trainer. Um, and I should back up for mo a moment. We do have an internal athletic trainer that primarily works in the fall. That person agreed to work in the spring and, and summer seasons as well to help us out a little bit, but really would like to just remain on the one season there. This particular position would be throughout the entire year, and we do have the option to uh, add an additional person at any given time if we so choose. And we've done that in the past in the spring when we need some more help out there. Because um, we do you know, have a lot of uh, activities at Redmond Park and, and here, and so uh, one person, it's difficult to cover all that. So we do uh, did include the summary of the bid results. Uh, we did include a copy of the contract that we reviewed uh, with our legal counsel as well. Um, and uh, the rate would be $25 an hour, uh, which was the low bid. That's about $26,000 a year. Um, you know, we were paying about 40000 prior to this, and that would have went up to about sixty. So it's, it's a pretty decent savings. Um, and uh, we're excited to work with this new company if the board uh, agrees to move forward with it. So uh, that's our recommendation for this evening to start, and it would become effective July 1st. We're good? Okay. Uh, may I have a motion uh, for the Board of Education to approve the athletic training services agreement with Rush Physical Therapy at a rate of $25 an hour, effective July 1st, 2021? So moved. I'll second. Uh, thank you. Wiedemann? Yes. Redzinski? Yes. Rago? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Page? Yes. Jalowicz? Yes. Ting Paul Pong? Yes. Motion passed. Up next, we have discussion item, uh, click renewal. Yes, this is our uh, property liability uh, insurance carrier. Um, that the, uh, if, uh, It's an insurance cooperative pool that we belong to uh, with about 180 some districts. I think I have it in there, 187 school districts um, that with the uh, idea to provide these services, purchase these services on a, on a cooperative level basis uh, for a cost savings. Um, so uh, we've listed the uh, coverages in there. Um, as I said, the uh, property, automobile, general liability, uh, boiler machinery, school board liability, cyber liability, which is a big one right now, uh, student accident, concussion, excess, excess property, fiduciary liability, uh, builder's risk if we're getting into construction or something like that as well. Um, so really, there's uh, the renewal happened um, uh, last uh, month. Um, 
with uh, uh, a remote meeting with, with CLIC uh, and the member districts. There really are th three factors, renewals, uh, impacting the renewal, I should say. Uh, there's been a substantial increase in weather-related loss events. Uh, interest rates remain near historic levels, and we certainly can relate to that as a school district as well. Uh, and then the insurance industry continues to see uh, increasing loss trends with liability coverages. Uh, the big um, uh, fluctuating piece here is the cyber attacks. You've probably all heard about this with some of the most recent things. Schools are not uh, immune from that. Uh, but they are at an all-time high with public entities, especially uh, being vulnerable. Uh, ransomware demands have increased significantly. So um, our uh, overall increase is about 16.5%, which is slightly less than the previous year. Uh, if you back out the cyber liability piece, we're about 7.5% or so. So that's not bad. <laughs> We'd like it to be nothing or, or low, lower than that, but it, but it's it's about uh, it was a, about a percentage more than it was last year at this time. The cyber liability there is a typo in there. Just apologize for that. But the cyber liability is going up about 150 percent, and that but the coverage level is also going up uh, to two million dollars from a million dollars. Um, last year it went actually went up 243 percent. So I guess there's some improvement there. <laughs> Um, but it's still a, a pretty significant increase. Um, but that's the, the renewal uh, for the cooperative. I, I inc uh, included a lot of information, background information, if you, if you care to look at that and read it. Uh, but there is an executive summary from the, uh, the pool manager who um, works on the cooperative's behalf. Um, but there's a lot of good information there uh, for, your, for your reading with, with uh, what's happening out in the industry. You know, they refer to it as a hard market, um, and, uh, you know, coverage is, it's difficult to get coverage, and it's, and it's, um, they're charging more for it, and they're offering less in return. Uh, fortunately, you know, we've, uh, our pool managers have been pretty shrewd in negotiating uh, pretty decent terms, uh, maintaining the level of coverages, if not in, uh, increasing it in some respects as well, like for the cyber liability, for example. So. Um, that is kind of the renewal um, of what it looks like for next year. That would become effective July 1st for the entire year. Wow. Um, and um, that's kind of the update right now for our uh, renewal. So I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have on that. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's, it's <laughs> part of running a school, right? It's, you got to have the insurance coverage. So, okay. 16.5% increase. Yes. Wow. Um. Um, is this in collaboration with other yeah. schools? Yeah, like there's a co-op. Yeah, there's, there's about 187. 100, yeah, 187, yeah. primarily Northern yeah. Illinois school districts, um, yeah. all the way from elementary, high school, unit districts, special <laughs> education cooperatives, the, the full gamut of educational. Yeah, in that co-op negotiation, was was there a period rate guarantee? Like, is it you know twelve month, twelve months, twenty four yeah, months? Is, these these are uh, guaranteed for a year. For the, the year increases, yes. Oh or boy, the, the rates. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, next discussion item is uh, to to look into a board of education bulletin area for our event website. Um, I think this was brought in uh, to discussion. Uh, John, would you like to talk about that at all? Well, we've talked about this yeah. as a way to potentially respond to public comments. We don't want to get into a debate, totally understandable. Um, sometimes there's only partial information given and we just wanted to try and find a way to clarify and be able to answer without engaging in, in debate, but to make sure that all the facts, at least as we see them because not sometimes all the information doesn't get out. Uh, if there's a way we could possibly find a way to start, and, and we talked about this. I yeah. guess this is just more of a, yeah. a formal discussion with the board. I, I I see a lot of heads nodding. I don't know if we need to take action on this. If this is something we got to take action right. on, if there's a way just to add a tab under the board right. uh, to yep. respond. Uh, you know, just just more discussion on this right. in a more organized fashion as as a board. Sure. As you know, John, um, and, and the rest of the board, we do have a, a website for 
our Board of Education, it will be on that tab as we see fit how, how we want to respond, like you said, General. Part of the discussion was too, if it's like a one-on-one -on -one sort of conversation with an administrator, we obviously would not post that. But if there's a general statement out there, like for example, the school, the administration and the board is closing down PE department or something like that. Of course, we could post that. That, that is, that's not uh, reliable sources and we could put something like that. It would also go out with the Wednesday words or weekly word uh, newsletter, stuff like that. But you do have a website and we could use that tab as you were saying as, as, as needed. Yeah, I think part of it too um, was was the 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 ability to make sure that we we get facts out right in, in communication uh, to to our 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 public the people that we serve. So um, you know, I think the the the, the way it came up was um, what was it was it the yeah what was the music you know music Correct. curriculum and and how. Um, we needed to make sure the, the communications out and the facts was out. So sure. So to answer your question, John, yes, we could do that. We have a website already set up for the board and we could add that information. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. I, yeah. I, we can't talk amongst ourselves officially, so let's talk about it here and yep. and I agree. I mean I think the communications within the board has been good as allowed, you know, we're directing a one on one response to this individual to that individual and we're gonna update this in the newsletter and you know, a tab I, I just I think the more we can get that out, the more we could respond and no, I don't want to engage in debates and have a six hour meeting, but we gotta be able, you know, when only partial information is out there or additional information is needed, to be able to disperse that information, whether or not it's read, all we can do is post it. Okay, makes sense. Thank you, but any other comments? How can we uh, get it out there so that it's, that people do know it's available to, you know, yeah. go to the site? I mean, are we, how do we communicate that? Well, I didn't know it was there. I mean, how will they know that at this point? You know. Maybe a blurb in the newsletter. <coughs> yeah. You Maybe know, the direction of the board will be a new tab under the school board. Right. You could check for um, Bo board messages. Yes. Yeah, board there messages. Responses. The new to the website, something like new to the website and the Wednesday word. I can put it on my section. Yeah, board board messages. Please review from any special communication from the board. Good idea. That yeah. would be good. Yeah. Let them know that it's out there. You're right. Yep. How do they know to look there? That that would be. I mean, we're gonna go through the work of creating it, and if no one knows it's there, then mm -hmm. we okay. might as well have not created it. Yeah. Thank you, Sylvia, good, very good point. Makes we, sense, thank you. Do we, do we wanna just follow up with it on next meeting? You or? have to speak louder. Oh, yeah, do, do, I'm sorry, I stopped spoken. Um, do, you, do we wanna follow up with it to the next meeting? Absolutely. How does that work? Okay, and all right, the, thank you. The thank newsletter, you. Thanks, And I John. think if there's gonna be a, a blurb on there, then it should also be in Spanish and Polish. Correct. Yeah. As you very know, Dell. Our website, there's a tab to the right. You could hit a language, uh, whether it's Spanish, whether it's Polish. Correct, Jim? You could translate that web page, yep. So they are, they are already. Yeah, they are, okay. So thanks, Betty, good suggestions there. Thank you. I didn't uh, know that, thank you. Ne next uh, is um, the discussion on allowing, or you know, the framework of our public comments. I know we're at three minutes. We, we do, you know, give a little leeway on that as, as we've seen tonight. Uh, do we want to talk about that at all? Yeah. I think it's a good uh, idea to, um, if it's four minutes, um, when we have five or less, or, uh, you know, just say, you know, if it's five or less, I mean, it'll keep us at 20 minutes, you know, of, of comments. And if it's more than five people, then we go back to the, to the three comments. And we, we can know that. Um, when the, once they sign up, because mm -hmm. because we do, people do go over, you know, and, and we allow it. So if we say that, then it's okay. That's you know, it's established. It's, it's if you're considering, you know, giving people, you know, the public yeah. comments time to express what they're trying to express. Would would um, would it be, you know, a suggestion to then put it in four minutes and then um. Four minutes per person. If we have five or more people, then five we go less. back. Or, or yeah, I'm sorry. Five, five or less, and then five or more is going to go back down to three. Yeah. With with 30 minutes per topic, is that what we're looking at? Yeah, but what okay. do we do with four minutes? And then they go. I mean, if well, they we, have four minutes, is it? But people use and usually people will uh, write something out and have that 
three minutes or that four minutes in mind and how will they know if they're if they should be creating something for mm -hmm. four minutes or for three minutes they won't know how many people are coming mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean we've always allowed over them you know uh, speakers to go over three minutes I'm so just if to you know yeah, I mean, it, it, that's why we're having this discussion. I mean, you know, I, 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 something was brought up. We see different boards do different things. Um, a, one minute can make a difference when you are composing something and you're putting a lot of effort into it. We watched our one student talk about the shop pat, the class and articulate himself so very well. And, and unless you're a good public speaker, you tend to lose track of time. You can think you have three minutes and come in at two. You can think you have three minutes and come in at five. I mean, we can't control that. But I think if we're fair and consistent and we put something in writing, it gives somebody a benchmark. And you know what, if you come in and there's eight of us and you planned on four, hey, I'm sorry. You know, we can't have five hour meetings, we can't engage in debate, but I think it does partially address a topic that's been brought up as I have spoken on both sides. I, it gives someone a benchmark to shoot. And it, I'm comfortable with it, but I'm only one person. This is why we're having the discussion. Is do we want to change our rules? Do we want to make it an action item? next meeting and see where the vote goes. If four of us say yes, then so be it. If four of us say no, then we don't. I mean, it's it's democracy at work, but I mean, it's, it's a question that came up and I don't wanna be the pain in the butt, but I mean, a couple of us have had discussions one-on-one, -on -one, illegally, appropriately, uh, no decisions were made and, and it was enough to where we thought it should be on the agenda to be discussed. I mean, I'm comfortable with the change. I'm comfortable with leaving it, but I'd lean towards the change, honestly, personally. It's just my opinion as one member of this board. Yeah, I, I would. I've seen several people come up since I've been here that do go over the three minutes. I mean, it's, it, it appears that three minutes is not enough time. That's, you know. Too. Yeah, so, so we, could, we could look at it as an action item ne for next meeting. Does the administration have any comments about that at all? Anything? Uh, my I comment is, uh, you guys echoed it. It's, I think it's fair whether it's three or four. As you know, we've been very accommodating and um, I think what some, some concerns I'm hearing is, okay, what happens if it's four? Is it now five minutes, the new time? I mean, it's easy to say no, I think, John, in many ways, but if some person is passionate about talking, I mean, our heart goes out to them, let them talk, right? And, 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 and Sylvia, you made it right there, you've seen some uh, folks here speak a little longer than three minutes, but we've seen also the majority of people within three minutes as well, to be fair. So um, I think the administration could go either way. This is your call. Uh, it's, 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 okay. it's your meeting and public comments, but uh, absolutely, we should not have an hour worth or two hours worth right. of public oh. comments. We're okay. already going up to, yeah. yeah. I, we, I, we, I had agree, a, but, you know, we had a long agenda or, today, yeah. I mean, what's the, what, I mean, I don't, I'm good with leaving it alone. I mean, we have always been good about allowing people to finish. Why don't you guys take a stroll, Paul? Uh, yeah, my, I, I my we can well, if I can just add one more, I, I, I think it would be better, based on past experience, that we go ahead and do the four minutes and if they still go over, still allow, that would still be better than extending it to five minutes right. and doing a hard stop I, because that would be counterproductive. Yeah. I totally uh, agree with you. Because Paul. then, yeah. Okay. So if we give a little more and then still, you know, if there's a speaker that still goes a little over, so, so I, think I think we could be accommodating time, we just, we rather than going for the hard stop at five. I, I concur, but I also like limiting it five or less to four minutes because that's only 20 minutes, that's a fair amount of time. Looking at our average number so of speakers, we accommodate yeah. most people on most days until we get that hot button item and then we're back to three. I mean, it's a minor change. I mean, we can do a straw poll and see and then make it an action item for next month or we can be done with it and move on. All right, it's keep in mind that, uh, that over the summer we had many speakers. Yeah, I know. As right. opposed so, to right now. So that's why we have the contention of over five and go back to three. Yeah, I w my only thought is just to reiterate what Sylvia said is I think that limit of if there's five or more, then that's going to limit the discussion time. Just simply out, out of respect for the board meeting that needs to be conducted, people that are watching the board meeting and the like. I think under those circumstances, when there's more than five, you need to limit the time. So whatever, whatever you decide to do, I, th I think there should be, I think that's a great idea to have some sort of delineation. Is there a policy on the amount of time? We do, right, Mayor? Yep, go ahead, Jim. Yes. To change. Policy, okay.
We have that already, Jim. Three minutes to up to 30 minutes, right, Mary? Yes. So that would be it. But it's up to 30 minutes per topic. So if we have four topics, Correct. 30 minutes right. apiece, we're still looking at two hours. Right. I do think we may need, if we're going to rework okay. this, yeah. we may I think want another, to build another in. wise thing, too, John, is, you know, like for, for uh, today, we had one public uh, comment there. I mean, we've got to just be gracious and hear it out, right? I, I mean, if it's three, four, I mean, I mean, you guys have been very, very flexible in regards to that, and I think the the, the, the administration have been flexible. I'm telling Mary, let them, let that individual talk, <laughs> turn off the alarm. Mm -hmm. I think I think there's some grace in regards to that as well. But once again, it's the board's choice. You heard our, our input, and um, I think you take a, a straw poll. Patty, you, I cut you off, and John, I cut you off. Sorry about oh, that. No, no, no. I'm, I'm I, I was just you. thinking that if you know if we left it at three minutes, but just gave them the grace period to finish what they needed to say. Because you can say quite a bit in three minutes. I think if you read the policy, you'll see some language in there. It might yeah. be enough, it might not be, you know, we can write some changes. Maybe we need to table it till next month and then read the policy. And look yeah. it up again. Yeah, let's, let's okay. push out the policy, because we may want to build that, let's call it a safety net, so we don't have the six hour sure. meeting of nothing but public comments, because Absolutely. And in the meantime, Kit has discretion to allow someone to go yeah. over, so we, we can do that too. Again, just a discussion item. We've had some debate. Let's have it publicly and openly and, and get everybody's opinion. And like we might want to build that safety net in. I don't want a six hour meeting of public yeah. comments yeah. and then three hours of work. I got to work for the <laughs> <laughs> All of us. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah, we all do, but yeah. I'm just saying, you know. By the way, it's 9.47, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so we're tabling it. Well, we're looking at the policy. I have, I have one other thing to say. Uh, you know, Kit does have the discretion of allowing um, it to go, but then how, how many people will you allow to, like, exactly. move on? I mean, when, when you do that, you know, if, if say, one person's up talking and, and they're number 25, and now. Right. <laughs> You know, you, you, you've allowed them to kind of go past their three minutes. Then the next person will say, well, what about, you know, yeah. why, why wasn't I allowed to go past three minutes? So mm -hmm. to, to give a specific time is, is important. I, oh. I think it is, uh, you know. Uh, Makes sense. Yeah. Because you still will end up running into an issue of, well, you allowed this person to go over. Why can't I go over? Well, you're number 25. You know, yeah. I think too, you look at the size of the number of people that are speaking and you have 25 people, well, then it's like a three minute and hard, hard and fast, mm -hmm. you know, you gotta, you gotta stop at three right. minutes from the start. I would think, I mean, yeah. if you're mm -hmm. looking at Absolutely, it, it makes sense too, Julia. To okay. No, I totally agree. Kind of, kind I mean, it's, it's and I think you need to say that. You know, we have a lot of people, everybody wants a chance to speak, so please, let's hold it to three minutes and, you know, I think if we announced that in the beginning, it would also clarify that. And we have been very good. And I'm just yeah. saying, I, mean, I think if we could clean some stuff up, we've reviewed other policies. Yeah. Or I kind of like the idea of a safety net so we don't have yep. five hours of public comment either because it's 30 minutes per topic and we cover six topics and there we go. That could be painful, mm -hmm. especially on these chairs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to cushion it next month. Okay. And, policy, and just to it's policy 2, colon, 230. It's on the website. So uh, let's table it and let's review the policy and then we'll come back to it. Okay. Does that sound good? Yep. Um, new mem member onboarding, uh, this was my proposal. Um, this came from just my own experience getting into the board as a new member and um, you know, I felt it was an important process to make sure that new board members uh, get the support and resources they need to be able to be capable of governing and serving the public. And so um, this was just some way to maybe address it uh, so that we can, we can be 
uh, a good board and uh, practice good governance. So, and and the, the documents were uh, e emailed to each of you. And I, I'm still not familiar with this, but are, are, are we supposed to publicly show that or? Well, you, you don't have to publicly show Okay, that. okay. Um, but um, this would be something where if, if uh, our board wants to discuss it, deliberate, and then decide on it, I would love to see that. Comments? I think it would be a great idea. I'm totally new to all of this. I mean, yes, the classes are great, but I would have, you know, like to have come in a little bit with a little bit more knowledge, you know. Uh, yeah. So yeah, the learning curve is like, Four years steep. <laughs> <laughs> no, I believe it. I understand. I mean, just a simple yeah. checklist. I mean, it certainly yeah. wouldn't hurt to okay. get something a little more formal. James, you did a great yeah, job. I was yeah, say yeah. That. I just want to acknowledge that. It's no disrespect you, but <laughs> no. it's also good to meet with the other board members or however, right. come up with a plan, right. get the president, and vice president involved. Right. You know, without violating the meeting and having to post it, and more than three members and all the other rules we have yeah, to fall under. I don't. I don't think it would hurt to, right. to make something a little more formal. Okay. And, and once again, it goes out. Please reach out. You know, it's it's yeah. it's, it's always. We, does that, if you need something, you want to talk to to Kid, to Paul, uh, a mentor program, things like that. Juliet and, and Patty has been on the board, uh, getting close to five years here. So, um, I would also make the, take that active uh, 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 action as well. Um, yeah, I, I I also want to acknowledge that you know the the process we had I think uh, was good was sound. Um, but part of it is as as a board uh, for for us to also take action, right? To make sure our board, our own yes. board members. So just wanted to be clear on that. I think I think um, I think the administration's done a really good job in reaching out as well. So um, so is is that an actionable item? Then? Do we do we? Uh, um, I, I would recommend that uh, uh, bring it up next board meeting again okay. discussion only and show the document and okay say, uh, board uh, is, uh, board is there anything else you would like to add to the onboarding aspect of that okay thank so you James. emailed out on June 2nd just so right. you guys nope. yeah, look at it for the okay and how, uh, is, how does this relate to what you did with one on with, with, well, well folks you guys know how I operate hey look we got a one-on-one -on -one at least twice a year ask your hard question my question has always been hey look how can I serve you how could we get to know each other better ask me the hard questions um, uh, did you go over any of these these items on that pretty much I think I touched upon them a little uh, um, uh, the majority of them um, I don't have the list with me I think I hit all of them as well as Illinois Association of School Board will hit them all of as well um, it's a uh, like what Patty is saying uh, it takes a couple years to get used to it but any way to expedite the learning um, I mean the acronym that's just gonna take yeah. time you know uh, but I think you, you I think you got the nuts and bolts in regards to hey look the board to membership is the policies making sure of governance um, uh, things like that uh, to attend all of the meetings um, uh, that are offered by Illinois Association of School Board um, you have to be an active learner kind of like what we ask with our students to do but there's one-on-one -on -one, there's kids here you got veteran board members here uh, uh, five six years here and and I think those are, uh, are are important but I'm also asking the veteran board members to reach out to to the younger board members who are saying hey look let's go out for coffee hey let's take James out for dinner get him some steak or something <laughs> 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 I, we yeah. would be happy to talk to you or if you want to have a special meeting with me and Bruce talk about budget <laughs> if that's your weak port, why not right okay. or Michelle would correct I, I, I don't know if I'd budget. recommend that one <laughs> I, I, think, I think a lot of times uh, new, new board members are a little bit more timid right so um, you know well one of the things for me was uh, voting for you know president uh, vice president you know of the board the new the new uh, executive board and, and I didn't know anyone you know like I like to know who I'm voting for I like to know what you know like I, I like to know where you know where they yeah. stand so that was that was one of the things for me and also uh, I guess just thinking about uh, having uh, that that part of it along with uh, me being sworn in and then also the same day voting on something that I don't know really <laughs> nothing about. Yeah. Right. You know? And so for me, uh, 
I voted, but I was uncomfortable. Sure. With, with, yeah. you yeah. know, with voting, not Absolutely. telling that I didn't know anything. Sylvia and John, I think you guys are doing a great job in trying to stay in put. Please continue to, like we got triple, triple I coming up. We're stuck together for about two and a half days, okay? <laughs> You're gonna have enough of us. Then we have a fall conference with another conference. Then we have a spring conference. There's at least five or six uh, professional developments for you folks as well, outside of DEI and equity training as well. Yeah. Okay, it is thank just you. A, it's a learning curve, but I think having an official booklet or something that's handed to you, a folder right. or whatever, I think could be helpful, you know? Yeah what you're suggesting, Kit, might be a, just one more tool in Correct. the toolbox is, is I, I know, uh, for me, checklists help me a lot and remembering a lot of stuff, so uh, maybe just a checklist, right? And meeting yeah. with James was helpful, so yeah. I mean, I, I think that should stay in place. Oh, yeah. It, it, was, yeah. it was really helpful. Uh, okay, moving on. Uh, next one is uh, discussion on uh, Board of Education minutes that are available to uh, in Spanish and Polish. I think Patty sounds like I think she mentioned that already, so she's probably in favor of that. What do you guys think? The tab that's on the website that translate does that have that'll translate? That, that is not the same tab. We can do this. I've already spoken to Mary Timmons. Thank you, Mrs. Timmons. We could definitely do it in English and Spanish, Polish. We will find a translator to get that done, uh, but that's not impossible to do. That's okay. we, we've done that in the past. That's um, if the board would like to do that. Uh, we can definitely do that starting probably uh, in August, okay, if not earlier. Uh, the minutes, as you guys know, is the minutes that you get here, okay. Uh, the minutes, the, um, what is it called, Mary? The board brief? The board, not the board briefs, the. In the board book. The board, there's the general board board minutes and there is the closed session board? Book? Yes. Yes, that, that should just, right. that's among us. And, okay. Until we release them, that shouldn't be Correct. translated. But Correct. yeah, because when we approve the minutes, Exactly. Of the previous meeting, those should be the minutes that are translated. I, I don't. Correct. I, I mean, we could translate it all. That'd be wonderful, because we do have a very, very diverse uh, population. Group of students and oh. parents. I'm trying right. to find the right word. I'm tired. Yeah. I apologize. <laughs> you know, we could translate the minutes to, to make a lot yeah, of I mean, short. I, Mary, when could we start that process next with this board meeting or the next board meeting? Well, if we start with this board meeting, the minutes you just approved are from the May meeting. Correct. So we would, I would actually work with someone to have them uh, translated from the May meeting. Or we could start fresh with July's or however you'd like to do this. I, I think to be fair, we should do it as one, Polish and Spanish at the same time to be fair and consistent. So whenever we, we can line up those translators, I hate to make more work for you, Mary. But I think in the end, it'll help get us that participation we sure. identified if right. the people understand and, can, and, right. and are comfortable reading what we're putting out. Understood. When we roll it out, we'll roll it out into three languages. I think that yeah. would just be fair. So let's plan, for, let's plan for this board meeting. If we could do the May board meeting, we will. Okay. Yeah, and however <coughs> fast we can find the translators. And yeah, I just, it's something right. we identified in all our plans. Let's try and address it. Okay. Mr. President, can you put the full Um, can, yep. Uh, the agenda. Let, let, let's I let's do this. Um, sure. I, I, probably not. The, I, I I appreciate that comment. I really do. Um, but we got to get going on this business. But we, we will if you want to bring that to my attention sure. later. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Um, all right. So I think we're, we've completed that discussion. And let's do committee reports. Start with um, the Bensonville Community Foundation. Sylvia, Juliet, I, what's going on? We've got we've got a meeting coming up, right? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow yeah. Okay. So we haven't had a meeting since our last one. We, it's been kind of pushed. Back, yeah. So. Okay. Yep. Um, and the DI committee, Sylvia and I. Uh, so we um, we're looking at meeting. Yep. Um, with a couple community folks, just to to get an idea of what's going on and the thoughts on things. Who is uh, the community folks? The chairs are Kit and uh, Mrs. Hayes. Yeah, so uh, 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 we 
fan reached out to us, wanted to know more about what this group is about, and then uh, the uh, uh, a couple a couple parents. PTO. So, oh yeah, P PTO, yeah, yeah. Uh, other than that, that's all we have. So, um, the finance facilities Project committee. Time. Yep, John, Paul. Uh, nothing new since the last. I mean, I, I think we're going to schedule a new one. Yes. Um, I, for this, for the uh, fall. July board meeting. Right. J July. It will be for July then. Okay. Correct. So. Um, you had it last month. I know, but we have to. Because we of have the other we oh. need to. Yeah, we're, we've later. had a few periodically. <laughs> well, we're going to continue that trend. It looks like. But no, that's a that's a fair question, Patty, and I give you an honest answer. We had Esther money. Okay. So, which is brand new to to all of the school district in Illinois. So, we need to meet meet on that. Uh, that was last month to discuss how we're going to use SR one, SR two, and SR three. Normally, we have a July finance facilities meeting for the tentative budget. Uh, this is also what we're going to focus on that finance facility meeting uh, this coming July. It's also um, with our new board members as well is to get everyone um, reaffirmed and newly affirmed to the referendum topic. The, the facility audit, where we were before we went to COVID. We were a step away to um, uh, pressing the button that, hey, look, we're gonna go for a referendum. It was uh, quickly stopped by COVID. We wanna make sure we're all on the same page so we could have that discussion again. So that's part of, the, uh, part of the topic that will take place next board meeting at the finance committee meeting. Okay, thank you. And uh, IASB, Paul? Uh, I attended the um, June 17th Executive Committee meeting for the two-page division of the IASB, um, and at that meeting we discussed the fall and spring meetings. It's the fall of this year, 2021, and the spring of 2022 meetings. Um, for the fall meeting, the tentative uh, subject is understanding the communication role as a board member. And um, we're actively looking for a speaker for that and the tentative date is October 21st, but that's not in stone yet. And the spring meeting will deal with equity, um, tentatively April 21st, but that's not set. So as soon as we re receive confirmation on speakers, we will, uh, that information will go out on those meetings. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Len, Patty? Anything? Oh, yeah. oh no. Wait, Leo. Leo. No, there was not a meeting yet. No, there's no meeting. No, it was not a meeting. <coughs> and you've got NETSAC? NETSAC, uh, it was to the meeting on June 7, and we got the approval for the 2021-22 20, school year. We got the renewal of the school board legal liability insurance. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of them it was just related to the budget, but the governing body is got to be approved on um, August. So July, there is not a meeting. Okay. So uh, I got to be there with uh, Mr. James. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There's a, today I, I listened to the ISAB's uh, um, updates on the, um, yeah, the legislative updates. And you can go back and listen to a register and listen to it. It was recorded. Um, but they just kind of quickly went through a bunch of uh, different things. And um, nothing that really stands out, right. but they, cause they just kind of touched on a bunch right. of different things. So and just to piggyback off what Patty was saying, there's that aspect of it. And as you know, I forward you all of the Lens stuff. Um, I know that's, uh, that's very entertaining reading. But uh, we I'm going to keep on forwarding for you guys to, to preview. And uh, policy committee, we had one today at 6, and uh, we went over policy. We don't need to rehash that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there we go. We had the you sure you don't want me to go through it again? Michelle, <laughs> 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 uh, <Michelle, I'll> take <laughs> it. <laughs> Item <Okay>. number one. <laughs> 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 Okay, uh, next board meeting is Wednesday, July 28th, 7 o'clock, with the Finance and Facilities Committee meeting scheduled at 6, prior to the regular meeting. 
uh, may have a motion and a second to go to close session for the purpose of the appointment, employment compensation, dis discipline, performance, or dismissal of the specific employees of the public body or legal counsel for the public body, including hearing testimony on a complaint lodged against an employee of a public body or against legal counsel for the public body to determine its validity. However, a meeting, a, a, a meeting to dis consider an in increase in compensation to a specific employee of a public body that is subject to the Local Government Wage Increased Transparency Act may not be closed and shall be open to the public and posted and held in accordance with this act, uh, 5 L, uh, Illinois uh, CS 120 slash 2 C1 and collective negotiating matters between the public body and, and its employees or the representat uh, representatives or deliberations concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees. Uh, 5 ILCS 122 C2, roll call please. Motion. So moved. Oh, second. Motion. Yeah, may I have a motion, please? Added. Okay, second. Like Roll call. Wiedemann? Yes. Rago? Yes. Figaro? Yes. Cade? Yes. Jalowitz? Yes. Redzinski? Sure. King Pong? King Yes, yes. <laughs> Let's go. Okay. I'll lay it. Second. Okay. Third. Roll call. There we go. Weedman? Yes. Figaro? Yes. Cade? Yes. Jalowitz? Yes. Redzinski? Yes, ma'am. Rago? Yes. King Paul Kong? Yes. Now we go back to open session. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. That's the one. That All right. Was, that's and what then we adjourn. just did. Adjourn. We went back into open session. You closed. Yeah. Okay. I may have a motion and a second to adjourn. First and second. <laughs> second. <laughs> okay. Roll call, please. <laughs> uh, yes. 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 Cade. Say yes. 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 Redzinski. Yes, ma'am. Rago. Yes. Figueroa. Yes. King Paul Pong. Yes. All right. Adjourned. Meeting adjourned. Good night, all.